Hello, everyone. Hello from Lisbon. My name is Magda, and I'm the head of conservation restoration at the Heritage Department of Sport Lisboa e Benfica. We welcome you all to our online symposium, Good Practices in Conservation of Special Collections, that we're hosting in partnership with the Department of Conservation and Restoration, Nova School of Science and Technology, to whom we thank for accepting our invitation. We also want to thank our speakers and moderators for accepting our invitation, but also for their willingness to share their knowledge and experiences. We're celebrating the European Day of Conservation Restoration, and this subject, Special Collections, it's very dear to our hearts here in Sport de Benfica. If you want to know more about us, you can check on our website and social media at Museu Benfica. I hope you have a very pleasant day with us. And now it's up to you, Marcia. Thank you very much. I'm Marcia Villarigues, the head of the conservation department of Nova School of Science uh, and Technology. And first of all, I would like uh, to thank to Spolish Boi Benfica for this opportunity uh, to organize this event as a, a shared uh, organization. We have been working together for many years since the beginning of the museum and uh, the storage that if when you have the opportunity you should visit it's uh, really a wonderful uh, storage that they have and um, the the subject of the special collections is very dear to us uh, as well as, as for benfica i would like also to uh, salute all the audience that is coming from the first, the very, uh, sorry, for the four, four uh, parts of the world, many countries, uh, even with the time zone differences. I would like to thank you for all your effort and for the interest uh, in this topic. And making, uh, following Magda, uh, I hope you really enjoy this day with uh, a lot of sharing of experience of information and of experiences and not only the presentations um, are very rich but also the discussions after that so thank you and have a nice day So hi everyone, good morning and welcome to our symposium. Sorry, I'm having some problems. <laughs> now here I am, good morning. Thank you everyone for joining the symposium Good Practice in conservation of special collections, cultural heritage in 19 minutes. I will start by presenting myself. My name is Elie Roldão. I am a photograph conservator and I am currently uh, teaching conservation and restoration of photographic materials within the BA and master in the Department of Conservation and Restoration at Nova School of Science and Technology. Before I end it to the speakers, I will leave some notes. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box. The box stands in the bottom of your screen and I will come back to them at the end of the talk. Please use full screen mode for better visualization of the contents presented by the speakers. And don't forget that this webinar is being recorded. Now, let's move on to our speakers that I am absolutely delighted to introduce, starting with Tony Kishkisu, who is in, um, who is a, a conservator and restorer at the Art Library and Archives of the Kalus Kubenken Foundation in Lisbon. Before that, Sonia worked for the company Luis Pavan Limitada as a photography conservator and as a professor at the Master of Information and Documentation Science at Science uh, at Nova School of Science and Humanities and at Escola Profissional de Recuperação do Patrimonio de Sintra. 
Sonia has a degree in conservation and restoration by Instituto Politécnico do Mar and a post-graduation in documental sciences by Faculdade de Letras da Universidade de Lisboa. Without, without further ado, I will turn myself off and hand over to Sonia. Hello, thank you very much for the Sport Lisboa Benfica and Nova School for the invitation. In behalf of the Carlos Kubingen Foundation, it is a pleasure being here and sharing this day with you and help to raise awareness for the preservation and conservation area and the preservation of cultural heritage. I will now start sharing my presentation. <coughs> So today I will talk with you with you about the special collections in the Art Library and Gulbenkian Archives and some of our preservation strategies. Um, for those who don't know, um, the Carlos Gulbenkian Foundation is one of the largest uh, Portuguese foundation, private foundations in Portugal. It was created in 1966 by the Lex Will and Testament of Carlos Sarkis Gulbenkian. Carlos Sarkis Gulbenkian was a businessman from Armenian origin who helped to mediate the exploration of oil in Iraq. So he was a very wealthy man that was born in the mid 19th century um, and um, um, lived in Lisbon. Lisbon in the end of his life. So he uh, decided to create this foundation to with the purpose to improve the quality of life through art, charity, science and education. So our foundation is, is in Lisbon and we have a museum that houses his um, private collection in a collection of modern and contemporary art and orchestra acquire a scientific research institute and also an art library and archives. If you want to know more about the Carlos Kubenkian Foundation, you can visit our website at kubenkian.pt. So um, the, the Kubenkian Foundation was founded in 1966 and the art library was um, open, open his, her, its doors in 1968. At the time that it was uh, created, the art library was um, has as main purpose to house the private library of Carlos Gulbenkian Foundation uh, of Carlos Gulbenkian. As he was a collector, he also um, had a very rich library with more than 3,000 titles. But uh, with the evolution of times, the art library became an, an library for the arts for the visual arts, for architecture, for photography, and uh, in recent times, more focused on contemporary art. In 2013, the Ubingen archives were created, it was created a, a working group, and finally in 2017, the Art Library and Gulbenkian archives were united in one single organic unit. And it was in that time, in 2017, that um, I came here, so, until that time, we, don't, we didn't have a conservation and restoration area. The conservation and restoration activities were led by the management of the collections management area. So you can also read, if you want to know more about our collections, you can visit the website of the art library and archives. Please do. So in the Art Library on, in Gubinkin Archives, we have um, a very large uh, collection. We have more than 400 coll uh, special collections that hold architectural archives, artist book collection, artist archives, general works, as we have a reading room open to the public. We have an ephemera collection, exhibition catalogs, monographs, periodical catalogs, private libraries, and photographs collections, more than 200 photographs collection. In the archives, we hold the memory and history of the founder and the foundation. So that means that we have um, a very di diversity um, 
found in archives and collections. We have a lot of diversity among our responsi responsibility. So I brought to you some examples. These uh, are two examples of the Medeo Sousa Cardoso archive. Medeo Sousa Cardoso is a really well-known Portuguese artist that lived in the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. So in the art library, we have the Medeo Sousa Cardoso archive and the museum holds his arts and paintings collection. We have also the Alvar C. Vieira archive that we have, um, I don't know if you know uh, Alvar C. Vieira, but Alvar C. Vieira is one of the, the most renowned Portuguese architects. We share the responsibility of the preservation of the archive with the other, other Portuguese foundation, Cave Sahalves Foundation, and also with the Canadian Institute for Architecture in Canada. Another example of our special collections is the Fernando Corner Mendes collection. Uh, Fernando Corner Mendes was a photographer, photographer and a filmmaker in Portuguese in the 20th century. So we hold um, very special uh, um, silver negative plates, glass plates, and also some rare um, color uh, transparencies of the 30s in Portugal. Another example that we have is the Yemen architectural collections. It's a photographs collection of the, of the, um, that represents and documents the architecture in Yemen in the early 70s. Our artist book collection is one of the largest uh, in the, our country. We have more than 5,000 books that uh, um, are mainly from Portuguese artists. And finally, the last example that I brought to you is the Carlos Kulbing and letter books. Letter books of Carlos Kulbing are really special for us as they hold the copies of the outgoing correspondence that Carlos Kulbing can send. So by preserving this type of correspondence, we are um, know, we know with whom Carlos Kulbing can trade correspondences and what he said. So we comprehend the foundation and the founder really. There are more than 500 books like that. So that means um, that in terms of preservation and conservation, we have a lot of type, uh, a lot of different materials. We have architectural drawings, we have architectural models, we have artist books, we have books, we have engravings, we have films and microfilms and manuscripts, newspapers, photographs and textual documents. We have thousands and thousands of documents and items. So um, how, how do we preserve them? Well, I have to say I'm not alone in this work. Um, I'm the only conservator and restorer at the, the Art Library and Archives, but we have an annual contract with a, a company, a private co company. So we have, I have the company all year round of two conservator and restorers that are an Aquari, Margarida Rodrigues, and I have also special projects when we contract freelancer conservator and restorers that work with us uh, treating uh, some special collections when we define a preservation plan specific. That, that nowadays we have Sandra Gahush with us treating the photographs collection of the Archivo Alvar season. So what, which is our strategy? Um, as we have a, a large amount of assets at our charge, is our approach is through preventive conservation actions. So what we do to all items is in, we, we properly storage them in, in, in vertical control areas. So we control light, temperature, relative humidity. We do, uh, as we have several um, storage spaces, we do integrated space pest management. We have an emergency planning that is shared with another uh, their services at the Council Community Foundation. We do proper housing, storage, and risk assessment, probably very similar to all of the colleagues that are assisting this symposium. And so we do that to all the items and to some items, we only do, re we only do remedial conservation or restoration to some items. So how do we select the items? We select the items to, through risk assessment. 
um, and we do that risk assessment on a daily basis. So uh, it's always related with the condition state of the documents and in other circumstances, if they are selected to digitization projects. Digitization projects are really um, something that makes conservation move forward because as the items are selected to digitization, we can do and we can um, uh, uh, take that moment to do the conservation ex action, actions. Uh, we also have um, a lot of requests for loans, for exhibition loans. And when the item is selected to an exhibition loan, is also, uh, if needed, um, suffers an intervention of conservation and restoration. Um, we also um, uh, combine the, what is happening, the Cal School Bank and Foundation projects in the art library and archives activities. So, What's different in the art library and archives? Well, I don't know if it's different uh, in, your, in the discussion we can talk about it, but I think what is different in archives and libraries yet we also, we have, we have as other museums and other institutions, we have, uh, have a lot of diversity. We have condition states different. We have many types of deteriorations. We have, materials from different dimensions, really small and really large materials. We have three-dimensional items. We have a lot of variety and concern to materials, organic and inorganic materials. We have different structures and techniques. And we, ha we have all that diversity that has relationship between, the, between them. As uh, for instance, we have a photographs collection that has more than 80,000 negatives, or we have the Archivo Alvar Cesar Vieira archive that has architectural models, that has drawings, that has textual documentation, that has uh, photographs that are related between them, the documents. So the preservation plan has, has to take in consideration the relationships between the documents. So we have to take in consideration the authorship, the documents itself, the context of production, the original order, and the provenance. So that means that the conservation and restoration team doesn't, or doesn't work alone. So we have to always um, work as a team with the archivists and with the librarians. So um, I will so share with you some of our preservation and conservation activities. So uh, one of the, our main concerns is the condition assessment. And we do that um, soon as the appraisal process is treated and we know that some collection or archive is going to enter in the art library archives. So what we do, we go, generally go to the house of the donor and in the, in the house, we start uh, doing the condition assessment. And if it's needed, it goes, for instance, for a dissertation process. We also document all our activities. We have uh, written procedures and um, at this phase, not uh, in the software of the library and archives, when but when we do the conservation and restoration interventions, we document all the activities. We also have to do the condition assessment on a daily basis to the library materials. So we have a reading room. We receive uh, audience um, every day. We have a reading room that can receive 80, 80 people a day. So uh, there's a lot of move, movement in the work. So we have to ensure that the books that are in the storage areas are stable enough to be uh, manipulated by, by our users that are mostly um, art students, architectural students in the, um, in the phase of masters and doctors and postdoctor degrees. <clears throat> we also do the condition assessment in the special collections project. So when we do uh, uh, decide to intervene in a collection or archive, we do the condition assessment, we establish a preservation plan and then if it's needed, we contract uh, outsourcing services. <clears throat> in terms of the environmental control, we have several spaces. We have cool storage areas 
cold storage areas and sub-zero storage. At the moment, we have eight freezers and minus 22 de de degrees Celsius. So um, this is really important in our, in, in my job is to ensure with the colleagues that are, um, because um, as a conservator and restorer, I work with the central services of the foundation as they have the technicians of the air condition and ventilation system. And um, every week I receive um, the values of temperature and relative humidity and with the illumi illumination team, the values of the, for instance, the UV of the lightnings. We are, uh, lights. We are now uh, preparing the one of the, our main storage area for the books deposit is going to be um, until June of the next year, suffer a renovation of the electrical system in the um, detection of fire system. So uh, the emergency in planning is something that we really um, are aware of the importance of, and we work also with the other services of the foundation. In terms of the housing, the housing, we have uh, several levels of housing. We have the special housing, as you can see and on the right side of the screen, we have a special box that was, that was constructed or designed specifically for an artist book. We have on the left side of the screen, a book cover that is, is done in polyester, just to ensure that the book is stable and could be manipulated by the users. And on the center, we have um, our, um, uh, a um, regular system for the archival materials that are doc textual documentation. Uh, on the center, what you see is not done by the conservator and restorer. So we have uh, the conservator and restorer, uh, and restorer as a direct agent that intervenes in the materials. And we have also the librarians and the archivists that help us as being indirect uh, agents to help us to, pre to preserve the, the documents. So they do this type of housing. And when something comes up that is different, they call for us. In terms of the preventive conservation storage areas, as I said, they are controlled. Uh, we do uh, the best we can to, to, to follow the rules and the, the regular ISU standards. And we have a vertical storage and we have uh, horizontal storage. On the horizontal storage, we um, store all the architectural drawings until one meter and 20. When they are larger, unfortunately, we don't have um, cabinets that are larger than that, so we roll them. We roll them and you have two types of system for the rolls. We do the polypropylene rolls and when it, we, we don't have it, for instance, for budget reasons, we do Tyvek um, rolls with Tyvek material. So um, in terms of the remedial conservation, uh, we have a lot of examples. I brought to you one example that is, is not um, finished, finished right now, is a, pr a project that is ongoing. Um, and it is from the Carlos Kulbenkian, uh, 566 letter books, and um, is being done by Ana Margarida Coelho uh, and Ana Coelho Margarida and Margarida Rodrigues. So um, this project is really uh, important to us, as I said uh, about the importance of the letter books, and is is the what we are doing right now. We are preparing this these items for digitization. So the purpose of this project is stabilize this, these documents so they can be proper manipulated by the digitization team and are stable enough and secure to be reprodu reproduced. So these items are in different condition states. So um, they are most leather bindings, but we have also uh, paper book covers. They presented wear, dirtiness, loss, stiffness, some are powdery, the bindings are, are, are powdery, and so the, the purpose was give them stability. We have a lot of different type, um, they, ha they have the same height, but they have in terms of the weight is, is different. So some presented adhesives, some presented losses, 
some really few uh, presented um, physical deformations, really accentuated dirtiness, and signs of activity, biological activity. Those that, that I'm showing right now are not treated yet. Um, the text block of these documents is really thin and fragile and presented creases, a lot of creases, in, in some cases, migration of ink of, from one page to other. In, uh, in other situations, they were um, shown uh, that were, they have tear, tear, they were really um, wear uh, by the years that they, they were used uh, because they were, um, they, co they combine all the activity of Carlos Kulink. Um. So what we did to them was we cleaned them all me me mechanically, mechanically the, the bindings and the interior of the end sheets uh, we fixed the detached elements, they were in the spine, the detached elements in the spine were really important to be fixed as they, they shown us what is inside the document. So in some cases, we detached and consolidated the leather, but we have some issues as uh, we have different types of leathers and different types of behaviors. And this, this project was a very, is a project that has a, a limited in time as we have to have these documents um, ready for the digitization. And at last, in, we are doing some polyester book covers to ensure that they are manipulated and put secure in the, um, rep the digitization machine. So I finished the presentation. If you want to learn more about our collections, you can, as I said, visit our website. And I, again, I thank you very much for the Rifika and, and Nova School for the invitation. So I will back to you, Elia. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Your work is absolutely fascinating. <laughs> and I think that we'll have a lot of questions at the end. Okay. I'm here for you. <laughs> thank you. Now we will move on to uh, Joana Silva. Joana has a bachelor and a master degree in conservation and restoration from Nova School of Science and Technology. Between 2009 and 2013, she worked for the company Luis Pavão Limitada. During that time, she was part of the conservation team working at Kalus Kulbenken Foundation Art Library. In 2019, she concluded her PhD in conservation and restoration of cultural heritage at Nova University, where she developed her scientific background and a deeper knowledge about photographic material. Since 2019, Joana is a visiting professor at Universidade Católica Portuguesa, Escola das Artes, teaching conservation of photographic materials within the Master of Conservation and Restoration. She is also one of the founders and conservator of Neon Art Conservation, a company specially dedicated to the preservation of modern art and contemporary heritage. Joanna, can you please share your presentation with us? Thank you, Elia. <laughs> thank you. Um, I would also like to thank uh, the Sport Lisboa e Benfica and uh, FCT Nova for the invitation. Um, I will now share my screen. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. Um, so um, I'm going to present you my, my, my presentation is called on the conservation of photographic collections, what to preserve. And I would like um, to discuss in a first part, what makes photographic collections unique or special and what is specific to photographic materials. Secondly, I will share the experience I had recently working with two different collections. The collection from a sports photographer, Roland Oliveira, during the time I spent 
um, working at Storage Conservation and Restoration Department from Sport Lisboa e Benfica, and the collection from the artist Angel de Souza. So photography is a technological invention that allows us to capture images by recording light. It was officially launched in uh, 1839 with the daguerreotype. Ever since, millions of millions of images were produced with this technology. In less than 200 years, photography has evolved tremendously. It started with completely, completely artisanal processes in the 19th century, developed to industrial processes in the turn of the 20th century, and led us to the digital era in the turn of the 21st century. As a consequence, we can find today a huge variety of photographic materials. There are negatives, which are tonally reversed images, normally generated inside the photographic camera. And there are positives, which are images in natural tonal scale. There are a huge variety of monochromatic images, very distinct in appearance, as you can see in this slide. This variation is due to different image forming materials employed, such as silver, iron salts, platinum, pigments, among others, in suspension in different binders, such as albumin, collodium, arabic gum, gelatin. There are also color images that can be produced with completely different photographic processes and materials. Moreover, photographic images can be supported in different base materials, most commonly uh, glass, metal, plastic, paper, but also others such as textile, for instance. <clears throat> Here you can have a glimpse of the variety of photographic materials with completely different compositions holding simple to very complex structures. Considering this wide range of materials, as conservators, the first thing we need to learn is how to identify all types of photographic processes and how these complex structures composed of several different materials interact with each other and with the surrounding envir environment. On, uh, one of the main characteristics of photographic collections is that a photograph normally does not come alone. Institutions holding photographic collections are frequently confronted with wide quantities of photographs. And when you deal with large-scale collections, you cannot spend too much time with each item. Thus, the adoption of preservation strategies is fundamental to preserve the whole, as Sonia has explained before. One of the consequences of the accumulation of large quantities of photographs is the presence of stacked materials without protection, uh, different processes and formats mixed together, sometimes very stable photographs are mixed with unstable photographs or mixed with other documents improperly stored, fixed with adhesive tapes or paper clips, among others. All these situations put at risk the physical and chemical stability of a photographic material individually. Another characteristic of photographic collections is the possible existence of very unstable materials. These must be traced as soon as possible to avoid total loss of collections. I'm sure, I'm sure you all have heard of cellulose nitrate materials and of the fires in archives and cinemas due to the flammability of this material. The first photographic and cinematographic films were produced with this polymer as a base, and its use was widespread from the end of the 19th century until the mid 20th century. As a consequence, it is very likely for a photographic collection with film negatives from this frame time to hold cellulose nitrate film. The degradation pathway of this material is very characteristic and can lead to the gradual destruction of the film, as you can see in this image. Cellulose nitrate were substituted by cellulose acetates, uh, also known as safety films, introduced in the 20s. However, cellulose acetate rapidly proved to be as chemically unstable as cellulose nitrate, the film showing typical degradation pathway known as vinegar syndrome. Some of the deteriorations include vinegar odor, uh, curling, curving, channeling, bubbles, blue, pink, or other color stains, among others. 
unless kept in very strict controlled environmental conditions, both type of films, um, this means cellulose nitrate and cellulose acetate, rapidly degrade, leading to the release of acidic vapors. These are not only signs of active degradation, as they are uh, dangerous for human health and can seriously damage a wide range of materials in the vicinity. Another example of unstable photographs is those made of chromogenic processes, the most common pho color photographic process. Under normal environmental conditions, dyes producing the image will gradually fade upon time. Additionally, these type of materials are prone to produce yellow stain. Thus, it is likely uh, for a collection of chromogenic materials to present a significant and irreversible change in color balance. Another characteristic of photographs is the variety of context in which it can be found. Photographs were produced by professionals, but also by amateurs, and as a technical or an artistical tool. Consequently, photographs can be found in museums, in libraries, in archives, such as a state archive, but also archives from companies, from schools, from a family, among others. And also uh, in photographers, artists, and private collections. <clears throat> According to the type of collection and its ownership, the way a photographic collection is looked at and the conservation treatment received might change drastically. Bearing this in mind, I am going to present you two different photographic collections and their conservation treatments. The photographic collection by Roland Oliveira and that from Angelo de Sosta. <clears throat> Roland Oliveira was an important Portuguese sports photographer. Throughout his career, he, co he collaborated with several national publications. As a member of Sport Lisboa e Benfica, he worked for the club's newspaper and magazine from the 15th uh, uh, onwards. After his death, his family donated his entire photographic collection to the Documentation and Information Center, hereafter, hereafter called CDI, from Benfica. This collection comprises about 80,000 images that picture the, the history of Benfica its type of sports, several events, key moments, personalities, therefore representing one of the most important documental assets of the club. This collection comprises a considerable amount of 35 millimeter silver gelatin negatives showing physical deformation. They were rolled and they present uh, stiffness. This set is of the utmost importance to CDI since it contains unique images from the activities of the club in the 70s and 80s. However, the degradation of the films was constraining their access. <clears throat> Although the information is commonly referred uh, within the restoration process of photographic prints, the flattening of photographic films is not so usual, uh, and only a few references to similar treatments were found in the literature. Taking this into consideration, a conservation treatment was developed to unwind and restore the original flatness of these negatives. The main purpose of the treatment was to enable proper handling, digitization, and storage of this important asset. The developed procedure was based on the de-shrinking process that was adapted from the conservation of motion picture film literature using a chamber with vapors of glycerol, acetone, and water combined with the flattening and the waves of the films. Before treatment, each roll was cut in strips of six frames with a scissor. Superficial dirt and debris were gently removed from the strips using air bulb. The strips were then cleaned on both sides using ethanol applied with a cotton swab to remove the fungi. Here you can see the first tests we made with different times of exposure to the, to the uh, vapors chamber and the final, final results obtained for one strip uh, before and after treatment in the, the, uh, on the, on the, <laughs> on the bottom of the, of the slide. 
So um, the treatment applied here the, was 24 hours in vapor's chamber and 48 hours under weights. The effectiveness of the treatment was monitored using a digital microscope. Here you can see the image before treatment and after the cleaning procedure, where you can see that the fungi was successfully removed and no abrasion was added with dissection. Based on the collected images and on the observation at the naked eye, the developed unweaning and flattening treatment did not damage the image of the negatives. After treatment, the negatives were placed inside acid-free paper envelopes. The strips can now be easily handled and digitized in high resolution with the flatbed scanner available at CDI, enabling the study and dissemination of the, image, of the images from the collection. The envelopes with negatives will be sealed inside aluminium bags after the digitization process and stored in no frost freezers to extend the lifespan of these cellulose state films. Now looking at the uh, Angel de Souza collection. <clears throat> so Angel de Souza was a Portuguese, uh, very important uh, co Portuguese contemporary artist. During his life, he was specially recognized for his work in painting and sculpture and also drawing, but he also produced a noteworthy body of photography and experimental film, which, he, which has recently been garnering considerable acclaim. His photographic collection is composed of more than 85,000 images. Um, the slide-based artwork Slides Cavalit, uh, which means easel slides from 78-79, uh, is composed of 100 chromogenic reversal films, which are also commonly called slides. The colored images you can see were produced by projecting white light from a slide projector through filters with the additive primary colors, RGB. Uh, and by capturing a superimposition of these slides successively on the same frame. So each image is composed of six uh, multiple exposures. Playing with different proportions of these three filters, he would obtain different color gradations, uh, different color gradations. So as said before, uh, chromogenic materials are highly prone to color change. In sliced cavalit, color change might lead to a significant loss of value since the artistic intention relies on color exploitation. Therefore, one of our main concerns was, as conservators, to understand if dye fading and color change in, um, and color balance was occurring in this work, and if so, to what extent. To do so, we developed a methodology to accurately monitor color change in chromogenic reversal films using a UVV spectrophotometer with optical probes. Based on the spectra acquired on specific dots, spots, uh, we were able to calculate CLF coordinates. Uh, this means color, color co coordinates. The developed methodology was previously tested on artificial age models. Um, that, uh, that served as, a, as a, a test to the methodology. Spectra can now be collected periodically on the same spot and the calculated coordinates can be compared to understand how color is evolving. <clears throat> so besides being worried with color change in this work, we were also concerned about the exhibition of the artwork. After the artist's death, his photographic collection has been exposed more often, in particular, in particular Slides Cavalit. In 2017, the work was presented as a digital projection, which led us conservators to investigate whether this would be an adequate way to exhibit it and how it could affect the perception of the artwork. In the, in the absence of the artist, the display history of this work was traced with the aim of providing a base to substantiate the decision-making process of, of its exhibition and preservation. Documentation related to the exhibitions was consulted and personalities who could have witnessed the presentation of the artwork were interviewed. So Sledge Cavalit was only exhibited 
two, in two exhibitions during the artist's lifetime. The first exhibition was A Fotografia como Art, Art como Fotografia, uh, occurred in uh, 79 in three dif different places. Uh, the documentation relating to the exhibition uh, at Fundação Carlos Gulbenkian was accessed, where a letter from Angelo Souza was found. The letter shows that the artist was concerned with the display of the artwork, describing in great detail all the devices necessary to its proper presentation. According to that letter, the work has, was to be projected on a white canvas with a specific dimension over an easel with a 19th century appearance and a hand crank. Sledge's Cavalet was only re-exhibited re almost 10 years later in Photoport Mirs de Fotografia. No documentation relating to the exhibition was found and the catalogue from the exhibition contains very little information. Therefore, interviews to people involved in the exhibition were conducted. Unfortunately, no one could remember how the work was presented. After the artist's death, Sledge de Cavalit was presented in Encontro com as Formas in 2014. On that occasion, the work was digitized in high resolution and the digitized files were used to make exhibition copies using a film recorder to reproduce the images on chromogenic reversal film. The exhibition copies created were projected with a slide projector on a wall in a small dark room. In the exhibition La Couleur et le Grand Noir des Choses from 2017, the digital copies made for the exhibition in 2014 were presented using a digital projector placed at the top of the entrance staircase. Likewise, in Potencia e Diversidade, Arte da América Latina nas Coleções in Portugal, also in 2017, similar options were undertaken. At Jornadas Lucidas 2, ao Porto, the work was exhibited in a one-day session dedicated to additive light. The exhibition copies were uh, used were produced following the same methodology as for the exhibition in 2014. The work was projected using a slide projector on a four meters wide screen. So after Angelo de Souza's death, different display options from those undertaken by the artists in the past were made, and it is possible to observe a gradual deviation from its first presentation. Over time, Sledge Cavalet, which I remember to you means easel slides, has lost the easel and has lost the slides. The specialists in this field maintain that a reception of the work is highly dependent on the way it is presented. The public who saw the artwork on the last exhibitions subsequently with interpretive new, um, new elements might have experienced a different version of the work. Additionally, with the exception of the last exhibition, none of the curatorial options was explained to the visitors. Based on the results from the research that was carried out, and considering the absence of the artist in the decision-making process about the exhibition of Sledge Cavalit, we propose that the work should be displayed according to its first public presentation in 79. To the best of our knowledge, the letter found that Fundação Carlos Gulbenkian represents the only instruction left by the artists regarding the display of this work. Additionally, this approach ensures the maintenance of both the aesthetic characteristics and historicity of the work. The visitors may thus experience how the artwork was presented at the time of its conception. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I... Uh, it's up to you now, Elia, again. Thank you, Joanna. Very interesting. Uh, Thank you so much. Sorry. Now, no ah, problem. Joanna. It's, uh, it's okay. You it's okay. Stop sharing, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so now we will move on to Francis. Hi, Francis. It is my pleasure to present Francis Leonard, uh, who has been a practicing textile conservator an educator for almost 40 years. 
Uh, she convened the Master Textile Conservation Program at the University of Southampton uh, for 10 years before overseeing the move of the program to the University of Glasgow in 2010. She was the director of the University's Center for Textile Conservation and Technical Arts History until 2020. She is the co-editor of Tapestry Conservation, Principles and Practices, with Maria Ewert and Textile Conservation Advances in Practice with Patricia Ewer. She has led recent research projects in conservation of tapestry and Pacific backcloth. So I will move to Francis. Good. Thank you very much, Elia. Thank you for the introduction. And Thank you for inviting me to speak. So I'm just going to share my screen. Everybody can see that. And hello, everybody. I'm going to speak a little bit about textile collections today. And as Elia mentioned, I was a practicing textile conservator for around 15 years. And since then I have been teaching, so for the last 20 years I've been teaching textile conservation. So a lot of the examples that I'm going to show you this morning uh, come from our projects that were carried out by our students. And I teach on the MPhil Textile Conservation Program here at the University of Glasgow. Okay, so Textiles, textile collections include many different types of objects from costume to embroidery, flags to upholstered furniture, for example. So they include a wide range of materials. You often have other materials associated with textiles from, for example, plastic buttons to paint or to paper linings on, on materials. But textile collections also often include an even wider range of objects which fall within the remit of the textile conservator, even if they're not actually made of textile because of their function. So things like paper dresses, for example, or you might get, for example, costume accessories made out of for example, leather, leather shoes, or perhaps fans or accessories made out of early plastics. So those are often included in textile collections. And textiles are organic materials and they're affected by the same agent duration that affect other organic materials like paper or wood or plastics, as you'll hear more about later today. Textiles are particularly badly affected by high light levels or by long-term exposure to light. So the two images on the, on the right here demonstrate this particularly. So this image here shows the fading of dyes, which is caused by high light levels. So you can see where an object has protected this fabric here and the dye has faded completely around it. And this image on the right here, this is a window blind made of silk damask fabric. And this shows the effect of light on the fibers themselves. So the energy from light causes photodegradation where polymer chains break and cross-link. And this causes both physical damage to the fabric and the loss of flexibility. So ultraviolet radiation is particularly damaging, but it can be excluded with screens on windows, for example. But, and ordinary other forms of radiation, visible light can be controlled we used to think in terms of controlling the level of light and it used to be recommended that light should be restricted to 50 lux for the display of textiles and other fragile and vulnerable materials. Nowadays we're more likely to think in terms of a number of lux hours per year, so something like 150,000 lux hours per year 
and that gives more flexibility in display. It could, for example, mean that you could display your textile for 1500 hours at a 100 lux or for a longer period, 3000 hours light level of 50 lux. Temperature and in particular relative humidity, which is influenced by temperature, can also be very damaging. And too high a humidity can cause dye bleeding, as you see here. And it can cause mold growth and the corrosion of metal components, for example, whereas too low a humidity can make a textile more brittle. Fluctuating levels of humidity are particularly damaging to textiles. The textile fibres expand and contract with changing levels of humidity, and this leads to what we call a fatigue mechanism of damage. So this embroidery on the left is tacked onto a wooden board, and as it became more brittle over the years, it was no longer able to withstand the stresses of continuing expansion and contraction, and it has split. So it's, it's split here and here. In the UK, a humidity between 50 RH, 50 and 65% RH is usually recommended, but this can, of course, be subject to different interpretation in different areas of the world and even in different locations. So in a historic house, humidity is probably going to be controlled differently to within a museum where it's easier to, to limit the humidity to within a strict range. So alongside these factors, there are other risks which pose particular issues for textile collections. And textiles can be readily damaged by poor handling. Even just moving a large and fragile object can cause a lot of damage if you don't plan how you fit before you start. Poor storage, as you can see on a couple of the slides here, can also cause a damage which is actually avoidable. And pests can be a real problem for textile collections. So an infestation of moths or carpet beetles, moths here, carpet beetles here, can be really devastating. And this is a sampler where insects have been eating, nibbling the textile, the wool background of this object and they were obviously hiding beneath the frame of this sampler. I think that another factor that can also be a particular problem for textile conservators is previous repairs and most people who can sew think that they can repair textiles so our historic textiles have often suffered many cycles of inappropriate repair which can cause more harm than good in the long run and a patch applied over an area of damage can easily lead to further damage as the stresses are pushed outwards into what were originally sound areas. So textile conservators take this into account when they're planning support treatments and think about the textile as a whole. So safe handling, it's a question of planning really, making sure that there are enough people to lift an object safely and that it's properly supported during lifting. And you need to plan a route before moving anything and make sure that there is somewhere safe to put it. But it sounds simple, but it's surprising how often these steps are overlooked. Good storage can be a matter of resources, but time is often the most important resource, along, of course, with sufficient space. And this is an example of state of the art at the Cloth Worker Centre, which is where the textile collection of the Victorian Albert Museum in London is stored. And this new centre was opened in 2013. Damage to textiles is easily caused by folding them as folds turn into splits over time. By, and especially by crushing them if too many objects are placed into a box, for example. 
So packing textiles safely in boxes, acid-free boxes, rolling larger flat textiles and hanging costumes on padded hangers can all help to avoid damage. This is time consuming, but it's a vital form of preventive conservation. Labelling the objects with an image avoids unnecessarily, unnecessary handling to find out what is stored there. A good mount is often as effective as conservation treatment in avoiding further damage on storage or on display. Um, the VNA, for example, has published papers on their policy of mounting costume on mannequins for display and also for transport. The museum has a really busy programme of loans to exhibitions around the world, so costume often travels to multiple venues. And the team has found that transporting a costume on its mannequin can avoid damage caused by repeatedly dressing and undressing it. Insect pests, especially moths and carpet beetles, as I showed earlier, presents risks to objects which contain the protein keratin, and this includes fur, feathers and horsehair, as well as wool. Monitoring is, is vital to make sure that an infestation is caught quickly. And of course, here I'm talking about European pests, particularly, whereas around the rest of the world, there will be different responsible for damage. But the, the core message is still the same, that routine monitoring is important. And in the UK, often we use these sticky traps or blunder traps, which will just collect insects and demonstrate if there's a problem. And on the right hand side here, this is a sticky trap from a historic house which suffered an infestation of moths. If an infestation is detected, then a treatment can be carried out. And these are pictures from Glasgow museums. And on the left, you can see costumes which are in quarantine, essentially, being boxed and covered in polythene. And that's to protect other objects. So these objects may be part of the collection where an infestation is suspected or they might be objects coming into the collection and they are quarantined until they can be treated to avoid the infestation spreading. And on the right hand side, you can see carpets which have been rolled up ready to go into the deep freezer for treatment. And objects there are frozen at minus 20 degrees centigrade for two weeks. And this freezing treatment is enough to kill all stages of insect life, the eggs and the larvae and the adults. There are different types of treatments that you can use, such as excluding oxygen, for example. It's customary now to freeze textiles routinely as they move between museums, as they go out for exhibition and return to their home museum. I think uh, this is a particular factor in textile conservation and textile conservators are often called upon to work with volunteers in their museums. So most large museums have teams of volunteers who can help out with the routine work. And this can be extremely useful. Volunteers can be really helpful in, for example, making padded hangers for costume or documenting objects and packing. However, it's important that it is recognised in historic house collections, for example, that volunteers need to be led by an experienced conservator who can make decisions about the type of work that it's appropriate for them to undertake. So in this situation, it can really be a chance for a textile conservator to take on a leadership role. So I wanted to finish by just showing two short case studies showing two interesting objects which were both treated as student projects at textile conservation at Glasgow University. This first one is a parka or a garment made out of seal gut which belongs to Glasgow Museums. 
It had been folded when the museum acquired it, when it was stored in this small, and very brittle package. So humidification treatment in a chamber, a humidification chamber was used in order to gradually open out the, the parka. And here you can see two conservators working within a big humidification chamber. So this is an opening in the polythene tent that's been created around the object. And this allowed the, the parka to gradually, very gradually be opened out and so that it, it lay flat mm -hmm. and that revealed just how fragile it was and how damaged, how damaged it was. And I expect that a lot of this uh, splitting had been had happened where the parka had been folded for many years. I think, incidentally, this object illustrates one of the perennial issues with textiles. That they grow significantly when they're appropriately packed for long-term storage and display. So here on the right, the object has been packed into a box for safe long-term storage. So it's basically flat, but with the arms the sleeves folded in. And some padding has been introduced here to support different elements. The image here at the, the bottom shows other storage mounts devised for this type of parka at the British Museum. And this mount on the left is made in separate parts that can be introduced individually into a fragile object. So these images show the parker being moved around the Zen, starting to head back to its museum. And at this stage, as it was moved, the lid was left off the box, just the parker was in full view, as the box had to be tipped to get it around corners and into our lift. So finally, I just wanted to show you this military jacket, which is a fascinating object. It dates from the 1850s. It belongs to Dumfries Museum in Scotland and was donated by the family of a soldier who was wearing it in India in the 1850s when he was involved in an attack. And the jacket is bloodstained and it has slashes throughout from a sword. And it was preserved as evidence of this attack. Treated by supporting the slashes with dial net, and you can see a close up here. So that meant that the slashes were still completely visible, they weren't masked at all, but this garment could be safely mounted onto a mannequin. And the mannequin then was carefully padded to fit the jacket. And this is a, a, a basic principle of costume mounting. You want your mannequin to be shaped perfectly to give good support to the object. But at the same time, it needs to give a proper period shape. And that is just as important with a man's garment like this as with a, a female costume. So costume mounting is a skilled and a time consuming job. In both these cases, conservation treatment was important, but mounting or padding and appropriate storage are both needed as well as interventive conservation treatment to make the object safe for long-term storage or for display. So I just put up a slide here with a few resources that you might find useful for thinking about costume and textiles in particular. And I just wanted to finish by saying that while many textile conservation treatments can be very time consuming, I would say that there is always something you can do to improve the condition of a textile. And that might be as simple as surface cleaning it and packing it into an acid free box because safe storage is one way of avoiding what to be major damage to textile collections. So thank you very much. And that's my contact address if anybody wanted to contact me if they had particular questions after today. So thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing.
Thank you so much, Francis. Lots of information and a wide variety of materials challenging also <laughs> our, our experiences. I would like to thank to all our speakers. Your presentations have shown a wide variety of materials, but also uh, huge concerns about the preservation, emphasizing the, import the importance of conservation for the safeguarding of the collection. So we have now received some questions for all of you, and I will also want to thank the audience for participating. I will start possibly with one question for Sonia. Sonia, there is one question about the letter books and how do you treat the letter books for digitization? Well, um, as, I, as I said, what we decided to do was just to clean them, uh, vacuum clean them with a um, vacuum with a IPA filter. So we clean the bindings and the end sheets. And also what we did was um, to fix the detached elements. And um, we have some struggle. We, we it irritate some bindings. But um, I have to say that we have some struggles because the letter, the letter uh, reacted on a different way. So what we decided for now is just to stabilize them, just uh, prepare them for digitization and then inspecting the condition state periodically. Yeah, I believe that. Thank you, Sonia. I believe that helped <laughs> and I, I think that if there are any questions they will be written to you later I yes, think. Yes, yeah. please do, please contact oh, me. Great, uh, I will interchange <laughs> for all of you I will pose some questions. This one is about the um, what is the best product and now no no what about copies from the 1914? Are they archived too? This, this one is about the work of Angel de Souza, Padre Joan da Silva. There is a, an interest on this wonderful work that you have done. Um, I, I didn't un understand the question, sorry, Elia. What about the copies from 2014? Are they oh, okay. archived too? Uh, well, actually, the copies, um, after they are uh, exhibited, the they start having problems of conservation too. So they will be um, faded and uh, probably will change in color balance too, because they have been in the slide projector for um, too much hours. So uh, we probably have them, but <laughs> they should not be displayed anymore. But uh, for that uh, exhibition, the, they have made very good digitizations with very high quality um, and uh, following the colors that are present, that were present at the time from the originals. And this can be used for future, future um, exhibition copies. This means you can use these digitizations that were made and uh, use them to make uh, new um, new exhibition copies with the same methodology. Actually, we found it was a, a good way to do it. So you have this digitization and you can uh, record it with a film recorder in a uh, a slide, so in the chromogenic reversal film, so you can still maintain, uh, although there is a digital intermediate, but you can still maintain uh, sort of the original uh, materials. Okay, uh, from your presentation, your Joana and Sonia, uh, photo conservation has a huge uh, role uh, beside, uh, before the digitization. Can you leave us some recommendations concerning that process? Because I think it's um, really uh, concerning process because there are going to be uh, some physical uh, movements on the object. So if you can leave us some uh, remarks on that or some re recommendations for everybody. 
Uh, well, Sonia, I don't know if you want to take that one, <laughs> and I can add something after. <laughs> Yes, uh, well, here at the Art Library, we are um, at this moment preparing uh, thousands of uh, documents for digitization. We have mo we 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 receive a financial for the European by the European Union, so we really have uh, more than one million. Uh, so, can you imagine of documents that will be digitized? What we define for all textual documents and uh, photographic documents, we inspect the conservation state of every, of every collection. And I think it's really important that you st at least clean them, mechanical clean them, make sure that they are stable. And for us here at the Art Library and Archives, it's really important the physical organization and doing the, the call number and replacing when the original um, units are really uh, dirt or with problems, replacing them and creating a good organization system. Uh, it's really complex because there, there are a lot of, as Joanna told, we have a lot of processes and techniques and each of them uh, requires some special needs. <laughs> I don't know if Joanna could add more information to that. I think you were also asking about um, the communication with the digitization teams. Yeah. Um, yes, I think it's uh, very important to, well, other or you have um, a digitization team in your museum and maybe it's easier to have this contact with them and even be there uh, to help them to 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 handle the the materials or it's very important to um to be at least in the at the beginning of the digitization processes to explain exactly how they should be handled how they should be um uh, housed uh, to and what where they should be uh, where are the sensible well, how to handle basically, uh, because sometimes it's people that it's, well, they are used to work with photographs, but they are not so used to work with uh, archives and um, archival materials. And sometimes there is some sen sensitivity, I would say, that is important to, 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 to pass to, to people who are working with the digitization process. Okay. In the art library, what we did for, for each collection in our archive, we, we wrote the requirements for handling those materials. So we, we I didn't say that, but we do with the, when the, um, the company, we, do, we don't do digitization, so it's outsourcing services. So the archives and the collections go entirely to the, to the supplier of the digitization um material of the digitization and what we do we do this type of document that is sent by email to each supplier with the requirements for handling those materials like and a protocol something. yes like a protocol you have to do that you have to manipulate the documents like that and uh, in some cases we have um, after uh, or before the the contract of the digitization we visit the the supplier to ensure that in that in the place they have all the conditions to handle the materials and we really are really de we are as a uh, foundation uh, really demanding on that so we only do work with the with suppliers that we know that will handle the collections well and we periodically we go there i, I go there uh, often to the, uh, the i think there are very good recommendations <laughs> <laughs> so uh i will have here one question for uh, Francis. So Francis, one of the attendees asked, can you tell us more about freezing at, as pest management method? Yes, yes, freezing is, as I mentioned, very commonly used to kill <laughs> infestation. But, and most objects, most textiles and other materials can be frozen. You know, um, complete pieces of furniture are often frozen, for example, if there is a problem inside in the, the upholstery. But it's important that 
the object is wrapped properly. So a textile is wrapped in acid-free tissue paper to act as a buffer against condensation. And then it needs to be wrapped in polythene and then it's sealed very carefully with adhesive tape so that no air can get in or out. And then the whole thing can be put into a freezer. And um, at Glasgow, they, they use a temperature of minus 20 degrees centigrade for two weeks to kill all stages of life. If you can use a, a colder temperature you know, below uh, minus 30 degrees centigrade, then you can do it in a shorter period of time, but that's colder than a domestic freezer. And then it's really important that when you take the object out of the freezer, you leave it wrapped up while it thaws, essentially, while it comes back to the, the, the hum surrounding humidity, the ambient humidity, and that avoids problems from condensation. And then when it's completely back to normal temperature, then you can unwrap it. And it's important at that stage to surface clean it to remove any evidence of the pests, you know, the, the, the frass, the eggs that will still survive. And that way, if there's a new infestation, you will know that it's, it's happened again. You won't wonder if it's an old infestation or a new one. So, as I say, I think most objects can be frozen. There's, there's some materials like glass that it's not recommended to put into. <laughs> Uh, concerning or regarding uh, freezers, there is one question for Sanya, but by, maybe the three of you can can add some something. It's about um, the question is: Do you have any idea about the energy consumption of your four or uh, your eight freezers for the cold storage? How big are the freezers? Maybe you can also share the the options that you have made to select the freezers. Uh, you want me to answer first? Yes, uh, well, you can start, please. In the art library, we have at this moment eight freezers. When we started the freezing process, I think uh, we were we were not um, expecting <laughs> to have so many freezers, but uh, um, in fact, we know for us results really well. They are domestic freezers, freezers no no frost, so it's the same made the consumption is the same of a do domestic freezer and I don't think it's a lot. We have also cold storage. Our cold storage area is really large. You know we have at five degrees Celsius and thirty eight percent. I really don't have an idea, but they are managed by our managed in terms of organization, a physical organization by us, but in terms of the environment by the technicians of air condition and ventilation of the Gulbenkian and is, is resulting for us. But I have to say, I don't, I don't know. Okay. Thank you, Sonia. Do you, Francis or Joanna, want to add something to this topic? I don't From your experience? I don't think I can add anything. I'm afraid. Okay. I don't think freezing. Me neither. <laughs> okay. Well, but it seems like cold storage and freezing is a strategy and uh, implemented for all museums and archives. So yeah, about um, the photo collections and and uh, in this case for uh, for Sonia, uh, someone asked, "What is your opinion or advantage and disadvantage of working on projects with in-house versus freelance conservators?" Well, um, for us, uh, the, the both ways result. It's it's okay. I think it depends a lot of the type of collection or archive because there are collections that are really complex, as I said. And the, and the preservation plan has to take in consideration the work of the archivists and the librarians. So when we, we need to be really close together, it's better to have in-house treatment. But when we have some, uh, and you, we already have it, because I don't explain it, but we work with the conservator and restorer for the bindings, because we, we have a lot of, uh, we have more than 2,015 books in the library uh, that regular books that go to the, the reading room and 
with those books, we work with a conservative and restorer specialized in bindings, and he takes the works to his uh, atelier. He works in his lab. And for us, that results really well because we analyze the books before they leak to the atelier. And then when he, he, he turns or we talk on the phone or go there to resolve any questions, and it works really well because there are books, individual books. They are go, uh, they go on the dozens, but they are individual books. When, our, when we treat archives and collections, I think it's, it's better in-house, as I said, because they are usually out. So uh, I, when I say, when, as I said in the presentation, we have here an outsourcing company and Ana Coelho Margarida Rodrigues work with us and they are here all year long and they work, can work uh, in, the, in the atelier of the company. But here, we, being close to us, we can res resolve doubts that came, came on a daily basis. So I think we could work on both ways. Okay, thank you. Uh, Francis, we have some questions for you. Uh, one is, uh, what was the material of the mannequin for the soldier's jacket? If it's really specific, do you want to, to answer? Uh, it, it is a, a, a stock mannequin, a very small a mannequin that's sold specifically as a very small base. And then it is padded with polyester wadding to create the shape and that can be stitched onto the mannequin and then with a, a, a cotton covering to, uh, on top to, to you know, give the, the, the upper layer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Concerning mannequins, there is another question. Uh, do, you man do mannequins become part of the object? Therefore, another object to preserve is uh, one of the attendees' questions. And it's very interesting also. <laughs> I dare say there are examples where that could happen, but I don't think so. I, I would think of the mannequin as a, a tool, you know, a display aid or a storage aid rather than part of the object. <laughs> okay. Um, well, another one. After preventive conservation and cleaning of textile, do you ever Ever, do you ever apply any coating to protect the textile? Mm -hmm. No, generally not. No, I think there might be on very rare occasions a very fragile fragmentary textile that is powdering where some consolidation treatment could be applied. But I think that's very rare and generally we try not to introduce mm -hmm. additional materials into our textiles. We try to support them either with supporting onto new fabrics with stitching or sometimes with adhesive treatments or if they are really fragile and fragmentary often just a mount to support them and to hold them securely so it's it's rare that we would introduce another material okay and we have another one for you <laughs> can you recommend some reading guidance for creating appropriate mannequin structure, structures for textile works? Uh -huh. uh, yes, there is a very good book written by Lara Flecker, who is a, cost, a specialist costume mounter at the v and I, I think it's called Costume Mounting, but it's, it's a very good sort of how-to guide that explains you know, a lot about mounting, Western costume particularly. Uh, okay, thank you on costume mounting, but Lara Flecker. <laughs> okay, thank you. And now another one to Joana. This is great. Lots of participants asking. That's great. Uh, to Joana, uh, what procedure did you do for the humidification of the 35 millimeters film? Uh, well, it was not uh, humidification. It was a vapors chamber with uh, three uh, components, glycerol, acetone, and water. It was based on the, the cinematographic uh, literature. We, it was um, what we found that could be applied to our case because we have tried previously uh, humidification only alone with water and we didn't have any results. So we, we had to go to something a bit more um, effective. 
effective mm -hmm. <laughs> because the humidification alone was not leading to any results. Uh, so we 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 discovered this treatment that was actually quite used um, a lot in uh, cinema films, and we adapted it because uh, we we didn't need um, times of exposure so long than that than those used in uh, for for reels from the films. Um, so we shortened the time and we applied the flattening and the weights because uh, it was our purpose to 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 get the 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 films flattened. Um, so this was the the procedure. And it it is really different because you have a, a severe curling of the film, mm -hmm. so you have to move to another option. But of course, I, I think that. There are some recommendations because uh, dealing with this type of, of uh, severe curling, it, it demands uh, some careful and some knowledge about this, uh, these materials and how to proceed, right? Yes, and um, here it was really important for CDI from Benfica to get to those images. The, the fact that the films were rolled and were stiffened also, uh, was really constraining their access. And um, that's why we, uh, me and my colleague Sandra Gahushu, we needed to do something to um, enable the, the, the handling and the access to the images. Mm -hmm. um, that's why we tried to develop this methodology to, to be able to do it. Uh, Joana, there is also uh, another question for you. It's how do you manage relative humidity in no frost uh, freezer? And Sadia may also add something to, to this. Well, we don't no, actually, <laughs> because, um, well, you accept the fact that you have some humidity inside the freezer. Well, that's why you choose also the no frost because you control uh, the the creation of water inside the the freezer, but uh, you know that you have this um, this humidity. So normally you do the the freezing inside those bags, aluminium bags. Mm -hmm. But there are also other methodologies. Um, so you when you sealed the materials inside, you removed all the air necessary. So you know that there are not uh, well, no, there are not so much hum humidity inside. Uh, and uh, this material is a barrier uh, with the humidity of the, the freezer. So you know that there won't be more humidity than there was at the time that you sealed the materials inside. Okay. And you assume that. And, uh, well, it's, sub it's uh, under, it's minus 20 degrees. So, well, the, chemical reactions inside are really slowed down. So it's not so much a problem if you have a bit of humidity. Okay. Yes, oh. I agree with Joanna. I think it's really, we have to accept that we don't control that, but they are really better in that situation than, than outside. Okay, thank you. I am being uh, called to say that we have just, uh, just some few minutes um, and I don't know, maybe I'm looking at uh, the questions to see if there is one that I can ask for last. Maybe Francis, can you, you talked about previous repairs and how can that be inappropriate? What are the boundaries and what should be considered with the, when starting a plan for the preservation of a textile collection? What what can be done and how to look for that uh, inappropriate uh, conservation methods performed early? Uh, it's a very good question, actually, because I think we used to always remove previous repairs as a matter of course and think that you know we should do a better job of supporting our textiles. Whereas now, I think we're more likely to look again and, and wonder whether we should preserve previous repairs as part of the history of the object. So we would look carefully and 
I think nowadays only remove previous repairs if they are seriously causing damage or perhaps if they are particularly disfiguring. So we might be more inclined to leave previous repairs, but to work around them and to provide support around them. So it's a, a yes, there are a many dimensions to deciding what to do with, with objects. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So thank you to all of you, uh, speakers and attendees. It was great to be here uh, this morning with all of you. I will now uh, present the last slides uh, to share with everybody what is going to happen later. So if you have any questions, please send it to these emails that you see here in the slides. And for more information, you can also go to this resource and uh, find out more about us. So thank you so much. We will see you at 2 p.m. Thank you. Right. Hi, hello everyone. I'm sorry, we had a few, uh, few issues here starting. Uh, so hello, welcome uh, to the second session of our European Online Symposium. Today we are talking about good practices in conservation of special collections. We had a very interesting morning session uh, and I am sure that this will be an interesting one too. For the ones arriving now and did not have the chance to attend the first session, uh, I wish you all a good 90 minutes of this symposium, intended to be an open space for discussion and sharing knowledge and experiences. Of course, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Ana Nascimento. I am the sub-coordinator for preventive conservation at the Storage uh, Conservation and Restoration Department at Sport Lisboa Benfica. And I'll be your moderator for this afternoon. Uh, bear in mind that during the symposium, you will be able to ask questions to our speakers, which will allow you to make requests for more details and other information, and thus get closer to your needs. Please, please use the Q&A feature for that. Okay, uh, so let's start uh, our, uh, our presentations. Um, let me introduce you to Susanna. Susanna Sa is a conservator of modern and contemporary materials. She has nine years of experience in conservation research, focused on synthetic polymers, identification, and aging studies. Since 2018, she has been an invited assistant professor at the Conservation and Restoration Department of the Nova School of Science and Technology. And she is also a co-founder of Neon Art Conservation. She's going to present her communication entitled Plastics in My Collection. Now what? Go ahead, Susanna. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here, especially with such a big audience. So I hope everyone is enjoying this symposium on good practices for the conservation of special collections, which in my case are collections made of plastics, as you will see in my presentation. I am sharing my screen. Sorry, I'm going to share it again. Okay, so in my presentation, this is just blocking a little bit. Okay, 
just to check everyone is seeing my presentation. Okay. So in my presentation, I will use the term plastics in a broader sense, including a large variety of modern and contemporary materials that can be composed by natural, semi-synthetic, or synthetic polymers that can be present in our objects in the form of solids, foams, rubbers, or film. These materials have been very attractive to industrials, artists, and designers since their discovery, resulting in an increasing presence in museums holding several types of collections. We should be aware that these materials started to be used in the second half of the, cent of the 19th century, so their presence in cultural artifacts from that early period should also be considered, especially objects made of semi-synthetic polymers and vulcanized rubber. However, plastics have been posing countless conservation challenges to our field. And many times I have been confronted with ungrateful troops, such as once initiated, degradation of plastics cannot be prevented, reversed, or stopped, or even with questions such as are plastics worth preserving? Still, why are these materials launching so many challenges to the conservation field? To answer this question, we should define plastics as polymers composed by very long chains of repeating units, which at the end, depending on their chemical composition, different physical and mechanical properties are observed, as well as different susceptibilities and aging behaviors. Plastics can have complex chemical formulations that sometimes are difficult to unravel, and they easily react with light, radiation, oxygen, and moisture. Also, plastics are known by their ephemeral nature, showing a life expectancy as short as five to 35 years, which as you all understand, is far from meeting the conservation longevity standards. Also, conservation of plastics has only started in the 80s and 90s, and every day new plastics appear with new problems to be solved. It is also important to know that a plastic object has a composite formulation, not only composed by the polymer, but also by a large set of additives, which may include plasticizers, stabilizers, and colorants, among others. And many times are these additives, along with the object history, which dictates the short lifespan and degradation symptoms of these objects. However, not all plastics are equally problematic. And if a plastic such as a PMMA has been considered to be stable to chemical degradation, other polymers such as cellulose nitrate, cellulose acetate, polyurethane, rubber, and plasticized PVC are considered to be the most difficult plastics to preserve in museum collections, being also called malignant plastics. Still, as said by Thea Van Osten, one of the biggest references in this field, if the 20th century was the age of plastics, perhaps the 21st century is going to be the age of plastics conservation. And luckily, my academic and professional journey on plastics conservation started in this century. More specifically, in 2011, with a polyurethane foam artwork to which a stabilization and consolidation study was needed. Then I did my PhD in polyurethane conservation in fashion and design with objects from wood, more specifically on the condition assessment of such objects and on the establishment of preventive strategies for this problematic polymer in storage. Then I integrated the research project, The Triumph of Bakelite, to which more than 100 historical plastic objects needed to be identified and prepared for display. 
requiring the implementation of quick and efficient identification methodologies, as well as the establishment of proper cleaning protocols for a huge variety of plastic compositions, such as polyethylene, polystyrene, ABS, Bakelite, melamine, and plasticized PVC, among others. Then in 2019, I integrated a three-year research project, PLASCO2, which explores the use of carbon dioxide for the preservation of modern and contemporary works of art. The final aim of this project is to design environmentally friendly cleaning and conciliation protocols based on CO2 technology. Within this project, we also study the gloves by Robert Teng from the Museo do Benfica. Then, more recently, I integrated the Glossy Surfaces project, which investigates and analyzes the impact of polyurethane coatings in fashion and intends to formulate preventive and active conservation treatments for these cases. So as you see, even though I have been working a lot with polyurethane, it has been this rich experience that has been feeding my knowledge on plastics conservation. But especially, it has been the close work with colleagues and international experts from the field who have been inspiring my work. From this experience, which included several aging studies and the development of safe and efficient preventive and active treatments for plastics, I thought on sharing with you what for me are the top five recommendations for good practices in plastics conservation in museum collections. These recommendations will include material identification, storage organization, and selection of environmental conditions and materials, as well as monitorization. As number one, it is extremely important to identify the composition of a cultural object made of plastic. This would enable to establish proper preventive strategies and to define conservation priorities as well as adequate conservation treatments. This would also enable to predict aging behaviors and to better access the causes and extent of degradation. For this identification, there are two main methodologies which should be selected according to our resources as well as on our experience with this type of material. One more indicative, we made use of our senses. So by looking at the appearance of a plastic object, like its texture, shine or waxy look, transparency or opacity and degradation symptoms, along with the possible recognition of an odor release and evaluation of the type of sound when the object is touched, we can indicate possible compositions for the plastic which for the establishment of conservation priorities and storage organization can be very helpful and a good guidance. However, for a rigorous identification, we should use analytical techniques such as infrared spectroscopy and pyrolysis, gas chromatography coupled to mass spectrometry, especially if we want to know more about the additives and some degradation products found in more challenging cases. Now, just to show you some examples, here I am showing two design objects to which the identification of the material was crucial to define conservation priorities and preventive strategies. So in this case, even though polyurethane was identified in these two objects, so a problematic material in museum collections, infrared analysis has also allowed us to know that the first one is composed by an ether-based polyurethane foam, while the other is made of an ether-based polyurethane coating. From this result, we could be aware that the first object is more susceptible to UV light and radiation and oxygen, whereas the polyurethane in the second one is more prone to suffer from hydrolysis. Moreover, as in the first case, the foam is covered by a thick white paint layer, so that's more protected from light, radiation, and oxygen renewal. This object was not put in the same level of priority as the second one, to which the black polyurethane coating is completely exposed to air and therefore less protected. So in sum, 
different priorities in the monetization plan of the museum collection were established, as well as different preventive measurements. Then in the different case study, the identification was critical for the definition of an adequate conservation treatment. Here you can see the pair of gloves by Robert Tank from Museo do Benfica, which were showing advanced degradation and to which the composition was unknown. And first, from an observation of the gloves, we thought the foam was made of polyurethane, as yellowing, brittleness, and crumbling were the main degradation symptoms observed and no odor related to rubber or latex compounds were found. However, by crossing the information obtained by infrared analysis and the patent research on sports equipment, we surprisingly characterized the foam as a synthetic latex-based polymer made of polyisoprene, polybutadiene, and polystyrene, thus requiring the selection of different consolidants. So in sum, infrared spectroscopy allowed us to target the treatment to the polymers identified in the gloves and thus to make a more informed and appropriate study for this challenging case. Then, as our preliminary consolidation tests with more traditional approaches such as nebulization and phasing were not satisfactory, and also a lack of efficient and safe consolidation treatments for this foam was detected, we also took the opportunity to access the potential of CO2 technology as a vehicle for the consolidation of the foam. Promising results have been obtained with the combination of CO2 and the PVAC as a consolidant, but more tests are still being carried out, and we hope in the near future we can find a solution for this challenging case. Then my second recommendation would be to store plastics according to plastic type. And why? Because over aging, these plastics tend to release volatile organic compounds, which can be harmful for nearby objects, promoting or accelerating degradation processes. How we should proceed? We should isolate the so-called malignant plastics and all plastics that are releasing odors, as detected by our nose, or by, more, or by the use of more advanced analytical methods, such as solid phase micro extraction, coupled to gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. Then, like other susceptible materials, such as textiles, plastics should also be stored in the dark with a relative humidity between 40 and 55% at room temperature and in a well ventilated space. However, there are some plastics which benefit from different environmental conditions. So once more, this highlights the importance of knowing the material composition of a plastic to make proper decision-making process. Now, another important subject is the correct use of wrapping materials, adsorbers and absorbers, because with an incorrect choice, we could induce more degradation into the object which we want to avoid or inhibit. The most common wrapping materials used in plastics conservation are the PET films, which could have a silicone coating, and also polyethylene or, pol or PET non-woven fabrics, silk tissues, and cotton fabrics. However, for the case of plasticized plastics, as well as all plastics which tend to get tacky over aging, Polyethylene should never be used because it promotes the migration of the plasticizer and the adherence of the wrapping material to the substrate. Then for cellulose nitrate and cellulose acetate, adsorbents such as activated charcoal can be used as these plastics tend to release acidic and other harmful compounds to the environment. And finally, rubbers and foams as they are highly susceptible to oxidation the use of oxygen absorbers in barrier film bags is highly recommended to slow down degradation processes. And here is a case study from my PhD to which several storage conditions have been accessed for the preservation of polyurethane foams in the dark. For this assessment, two main conditions were defined, open air, 
and sealed enclosures made of barrier film bags. And among the enclosed, room temperature, cool temperature, and anoxic were tested. This experiment lasts for one year, and the samples were collected after one, three, six, nine, and 12 months, and analyzed by multi-analytical techniques. From the stereo microscopy images that you can see here, it is possible to observe that along the dark aging experiment, the samples kept inside barrier film bags and that are here identified as enclosed, cool, and anoxic, remained white through the entire aging. In contrast, open air resulting drastically yellowed samples already visible after one month in the dark. Then from the use of Raman spectroscopy, even though all these enclosed systems proved to minimize color changes, anoxic and cool storage were the ones showing the best results in relation to the prevention of molecular changes, as fewer spectral variations have been detected for these two cases. Then finally, my last recommendation is the monitorization of your plastic objects every six months, especially the ones made of the so-called malignant plastic. And why? Because the degradation in plastic objects happens very quickly and without notice. And because it is difficult to identify the autocatalytic point. An example is this standing lamp that you can see here from 1999 that was included in an exhibition in 2002 due to its perfect good condition. However, after only a few months on display, one corner of the lampshade started to degrade and it was necessary to remove the object from the exhibition. Nonetheless, after only a few weeks in storage, the foam completely collapsed and the lampshade fell on the floor, being now composed by these poor sediments, as you can see in this image. So in sum, I would like to finish my presentation by highlighting the fundamental role of preventive conservation, as it is definitely one of the most effective and efficient ways of expanding the lifespan of these cultural objects. As stated by John Morgan, although almost 30 years ago, it is already clear from the work to date that if plastics are to survive, they will require more in the way of preventive conservation than has hitherto been given to most other materials. This sentence not only continues to be accurate, as it is specifically imperative in this field. So thank you so much for your attention. I also leave here my email address if anyone wants to pose any questions. But I am very curious about your questions at the end of the symposium. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, Susanna. Uh, be, be sure that, that I'm sure that there will be very interesting questions for you from the audience at the end. Thank you. <laughs> uh, now I would like to introduce you to our next speaker, uh, Marisa Pamplona. Marisa is the head of the Conservation Science Department and Research Laboratory, which is established at the Deutsche Museum in 2014. Together with her research team, she focuses on character characterizing plastic materials from historic collections, assessing treatment, and implementing preventing conservation measures. Her communication is entitled Conservation Science at the Deutsche Museum, Analytical Research on Plastics and Preventive Conservation Measures for the Future Exhibitions and Storage. Go ahead, Marisa. Uh, thank you very much, Namelia. Um, I would like to thank you very much also for the invitation and for organizing this wonderful meeting. Um, it's really good to be able to share with many of you what we do in our museum and also to learn from you and the speakers invited today. Um, I hope the presentation, yes. So um, I was thinking also a bit like uh, all the presenters today, speakers, what are good practices in our field and coming close together what uh, Francis already today did 
um, which resources are there for us to look at, and especially those in open access. I just grabbed a few websites, so I'm sure I'm missing many websites, and I would like to invite everybody who's there to please include in the question and answers, not only questions, but perhaps also further websites with good resources that we could share among each other. So I just would like to show you those resources, uh, open access for free uh, for those who have internet that I think are really useful. I would start with the Canadian Conservation Institute, I'm sure you know it, with the Agents of Deterioration and Risk Assessment, or the Getty Conservation Institute with so many publications online, uh, with the Rutgen Forschungslabor with many results from audit tests accessible for those who want to see and check or to just ask them again to make uh, an analysis or from the Science Museum Group, especially now considering our reality here at the museum. Uh, they created many policies, for instance, the conservation policy, but also um, a procedure for selecting and reviewing, operating or working um, collection objects. We have at the museum as well, at the Deutsches Museum, such objects that are to be kept in their function and how to choose who is to be involved and which considerations have to be made are written there and they are really very good guidance. But also, for instance, some problems we have at our museum, like hazards, materials, uh, for instance, asbestos. So a policy on that is also a great help and especially that they are publicly available. So I just showed you a few websites from institutions. Other examples of good websites are results of research projects. For instance, the memory project was about a dosimeter and you find under additional information, a very good sum up of good literature on pollutants. Uh, another good website for sure is the pop art. We just heard about plastics from Susanna Sa. And this is something really good. If you have plastics in our collection, you learn a lot from this open access website. And another example of what I believe also a very good website is the IROG infrared and Rama users group. So mainly now not from an institution or um, a research project, but from a network of colleagues who share their knowledge, who uh, want to put available their information and people can also use it and it's growing. So I think this is fantastic. Please insert in the chat further uh, websites that you think we all should look at in our day life. And that's the point. I just gave you now a sum up of some resources I normally use. Now I'd like to introduce you our reality. I organized the presentation today in four main parts. I will speak about us and how we work. I will show you two case studies and then which efforts we are doing in communication, our results. So we'll start with us. The Deutsches Museum is a very large museum for science and technology in Germany. And I did now in black, most mainly the areas uh, where you find our heritage. We have exhibition objects. We have objects also in the storage areas. We have an archive and a library. And in blue, mainly the stakeholders, meaning the people who are involved in dealing with these objects or these collections. So we have uh, 25 curators for the objects and several conservators, mainly divided in workshops for the exhibition objects and in the storage area for those objects in the storage. We have the um, directors of the archive and library with some own technicians to take care of their collections. The Deutsches Museum belongs to the Leibniz Association, which is a German network of research institutes, among which eight research museums are part of that network, and we are a research museum of that network. We have the advantage to be co-founded by them and are being evaluated every seven years by them, so which output we have in the field of research. And exactly 2010, uh, the Evaluation Commission suggested uh, the creation of a new department, a new profile at the Deutsches Museum. Um, that was the beginning of establishing our department, 2014, and our research laboratory two years later. We belong to the research institute, so we are not directly under any black part of our museum connected to the collections, whether objects or uh, written sources. So, what I wanted to show you with these black areas is that I believe they are pretty vertical. This is how they were growing from the past. 
and we try to go in a more horizontal way. We believe our knowledge should be there for everybody and that's what we try as much as we can to go for all parts of the collection and as much as we can for all colleagues. But we are, of course, not so many people. And that's again, speaking of resources. I would like now to introduce you a bit our objects collection. I will be mainly speaking about that. We have 120,000 objects divided in four main areas, natural sciences, technology, navigation, aviation, and aerospace, uh, road and rail traffic. And we have from those objects at least 17,000 which contain plastics. You may find plastics in our museum, in photo and film collection, in robotic, telecommunication, informatic, um, aerospace, automobile, and you just need to look at it and you will find it. As Susanna Tessar just previously said, they are very problematic materials. If you speak of a long time average of maximum 25, 35 years, this is not what we wish for our collection. And um, if we now go for the lab and which resources we wanted to have, and we could invest it in, we took into consideration that in Munich, some other museums also work on the field of conservation of plastics, but don't have too many resources to do it meaning that there was a gap and we felt that was a good investment to go for a lab specialized on plastics. For Germany, we have some groups, but still not too many. And worldwide, I believe it's also a good investment to work in this field. Therefore, we acquired an infrared spectrometer, which is small enough, can be transported. Another one coupled with thermogravimetric analysis, a pyrolysis gas chromatograph coupled with mass spectrometer, a gel permeation chromatograph, which is also known as um, size exclusion chromatograph, thermomechanical analyzator, several microscopes and stereo microscopes, and spectrophotometer, climate chamber for te thermogravimetric uh, simulation of uh, artificial aging, and x ray fluorescence. The team and the staff who is working in the lab this year, we are four of us. One is also doing a PhD in a research project. The team has been changing and is still in the consolidation phase, which is somehow hard because the competences you need to work with these equipments are really specialized. And this is something we still need to show to our museum how important it is to have a long-term perspective for the staff working in our department. We do have this year three scholars in residence, so research guests that came to our museum and are funded by our museum for a period of around three to six months. So it's a program one can apply for if one works with the collection or with archive or with the library. And we have until now five students this year and three of them were doing their research with, an, with us uh, in the context of their master thesis. So it's also with the students a win-win situation. They have access to a good question, I believe, and an interesting context, and we get a good re report and also some support for us. So it's um, also a win-win situation. Um, I would now come up for the first case study uh, that I would like to introduce you. Um, we were implementing uh, preventive conservation measures in the storage area in collaboration with our colleagues. Uh, for three-dimensional cellulose nitrate and cellulose acetate objects. The context why this work is being made is that presently the main exhibition building at the Museum Island is nearly being coming 100 years old and is being refurbished because <laughs> um, we need to, to be more adapted to uh, the security level uh, needed for nowadays. And um, half of the exhibition area is presently closed. It looks as it is in the photo meaning that all collections had to be taken to another place. And who is doing that is our management department for the collection, for the storage area. And they are doing a fantastic work by documenting, by handling more carefully objects during transportation and improving the preventive conservation measures in our storage areas. You see in the lower photo some colleagues, there are several uh, professions and uh, working there, some photographs, some registers, and uh, we also have their conservators. And they are like the eyes for us because they see many objects. They 
insert in the database information on material and on condition state, and this is a very important input for us. The colleagues, especially when it comes to plastics, and Susanna Tsar just showed it really good, it's not always easy to recognize what is what. Um, and especially because our colleagues were really interested to distinguish which of those are cellulose nitrate, so now written as CN and cellulose acetate as CR. Um, they did a preliminary assumption based on visual appearance, the application of the object, the time of production, um, the decay patterns and also the smell, and then asked us, made a preliminary separation of those objects and asked us to do some rigorous analysis, as Susanna just asked, uh, called it. So we brought our movable transportable um, infrared spectrometer and did in situ as much as we could, and you can see it in the photo non-destructively, so without taking samples. Whenever we did uh, have to take a sample was a tiny one and then kept at our laboratory also for the possibility of future analysis. So based on this um, infrared spectroscopy analysis and also through our database and with literature, we could mainly identify which were those made of cellulose acetate and nitrate. The confirmation of those objects was then rewritten in the database as being really confirmed and the storage management department keeps those, those objects in a separate storage area at an average temperature of 17 degrees and monitors also the condition of that collections. So what you see in the lower picture is a room inside the storage area. In the lower part are the cellulose nitrate objects and in the upper part are the cellulose acetate. I believe, I hope this is a fruitful collaboration so our colleagues can improve their procedures by knowing input from us. On the other side, their input and this work together also gave us um, the stimulus to go a bit deeper. And that was, uh, or is the research of my colleague, Christina Elzessa. So if you look at the picture, you'll see um, the spectacles are made of cellulose nitrate that you have to trust me, but they are in a very bad condition and uh, the curator of the optics collection felt they were of no further value. As Susanna just mentioned before, you cannot stop it and sometimes it's too late. So like Susan Mossman, is it still worthwhile um, keeping that? Well, our curator thought no. So they were deassessed. Now they belong to our research laboratory and Christina felt there should be something more to do with this or at least other alternatives. It's not only about spectacles, but perhaps really very good objects that museums want to keep. We know from the talks in the morning from Sonia and Joanna that uh, freeze and cold temperatures are already being used for photographic films, also made of cellulose nitrate. The question of Christina now is mainly whether, as for the spectacles, when you have uh, thicker materials or specific geometries or a combination of metal and cellulose nitrate, whether cool, cold, or even freeze would still be good solutions when you think that the dilatation, this linear coefficient of dilatation of several materials will be different and whether we might have bigger problems than better solutions. So she wrote a research proposal which was funded by the German Federal Environmental Foundation. And if you want to know further information, you can look on the links. My next case study is then a collaboration where we try to implement preventive conservation measures in the planning of future exhibitions. Again, together, this future initiative, the fact that several cur curators are dealing with the renovation and or renewing of their permanent exhibitions. So this is a task that involves many, many co-workers of the Deutsches Museum and especially it's an opportunity now to do something that will then influence the next 40 years of this building and those exhibitions. And I'm really happy that the head of conservation and also a curator recognized the value of Charlotte Holzer. She was collaborating with our department as a PhD student and later on as a scholar. And then recognized her value and decided to hire her within this project of the renovation in order to suggest preventive conservation measures for the future exhibitions of historical aviation and maritime navigation. So this is the room, the exhibition room, as it looks like today. You have in the upper part the historical aviation, in the lower part the maritime navigation. 
it's a very, very big room and with a predominance of historical objects made of wood and textiles. We have for the historical aviation large windows and we also learned from Frances today on her presentation on textiles that long light exposure but also high level of lux are problematic for textiles and Charlotte Holtz is a textile conservator. She was clearly aware of the situation and she decided to do some perform some UV and these measurements in the exhibition area. She prepared then um, in a plan what you see these colored uh, numbers meaning like green light, red light, sorry, green light, yellow light or red light and we don't have any green light anymore. We have only yellows or red. Yellow being twice higher than the suggested values from guidelines, red three times more and dark red even 10 times more. And this map is like a risk assessment. It just helps to show curators or other colleagues, architects, which are not from our field and to impress them somehow that this is too much and we should avoid it. We have to block it. We have to get rid of it. And with some people, perhaps words work um, best with other perhaps images, with others perhaps the guideline you are relying your argumentation on and with others uh, perhaps the other museum, uh, the neighbor one that just did differently than us. And with some people perhaps it doesn't work anything because it's not the right time for them and you have to come back. And I think the very nice feature of Charlotte is that she's trying and trying and trying and trying. And this is what she wit wishes for the future permanent exhibition. So to have screens which now are marked in blue and block completely the natural light. Um, half of those already are accepted and are being included in the planning. We just wish uh, she can manage all of those. So we cross our fingers for her that she can fulfill her aims. I would now like to come to the last part of my presentation and also show you which efforts we are doing in communication. Our results, um, we had the opportunity 2018 to participate uh, within the Cultural Heritage Year to interact and communicate with the public. Um, we had uh, science shows, meaning um, talks with an interactive character in the auditorium of the permanent exhibition. Uh, within around four months, we had twice a week these um, science shows. And so as you can see, um, close to the colleague uh, who is presenting, there is a table where we had samples or sometimes small instruments and tried to show the visitors a bit closer what we do. We also made a kids program um, in the kids uh, exhibition area of our museum on Saturdays so families could come with the kids and they were looking kind of integrated pest management uh, which insects uh, normally eat textiles paper or wood so recognize their morphology and categorize them in these three uh, groups uh, we did with the other seven research museums because a common activity of all of us um, a film and a multimedia game and I think it was a really interesting uh, process, of course, time consuming, but also to get the feedback that people actually value what we do and uh, the efforts we take. We are starting to do or developing first policies. Um, the one, of course, is written in German, I'm really sorry, but it's basically a policy to try to help the curators within this process of reviewing their future permanent exhibitions, which aspects they should consider when they are planning their exhibition, in, in, in the field of preventive conservation. And what I'm also very proud of is this, this policy is a common work of um, the head of the conservation department, um, the team uh, manager of the conservators in the storage management department and um, colleagues from our department. So we just work together. And if you remember one of the slides I showed you before, somehow these vertical structures, I think we're really giving steps to make it a little bit more horizontal and sharing the knowledge among us and come further together. We also, of course, want and invest in communicating and interacting with peers like you today in this symposium. Uh, we ourselves are co-organizing a virtual conference 
dedicated to the topic of plastic. So if you like that topic, you just can go for the link. Still register, it's still open. It will be next month. If you're not interested, but you know someone, please just forward it. I'm thanking for that. Um, and we try, of course, also to publish and especially in open access. Um, and because of our field of trying to specialize on the characterization of plastics, uh, we just recently published an article together with the colleagues from uh, the Department of Conservation and Restoration from the Nova University on characterizing polymethyl metacrylate, but also we just submitted two further articles on characterizing celluloid and also cellulose nitrate. So I started sharing with you resources which are open source, are for free for those who have internet. Then I came to our real case study and our reality, so implementing and how we are managing to implement it. And I'm giving you an idea of which efforts we are trying to do to hopefully also give to others what we learn, what we implemented meanwhile. And I think this is a good strategy. I hope everyone who can should go in the same direction. So I would thank many people. And if you don't mind, I will say very fast their names. Christina Alzessa, Charlotte Holzer, Anna Michelus, Stephanie Kavda, Teresa Donner, Veronika Meyer, Helmut Trischler, Ulf Sagen, Elisabeth Knott, Susanne Griesbach, Tatjana Kessler, Matthias Knopf, Susanne Hehn, Elke Svirtnia, Silman Mindermann, Susanne Brunner, Julia Savitsky, Katharina Brenstorf, Niti Fatak, Hannah Kirsch, and Louisa Burden. And to you all, thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you, Marisa. Uh, what a wonderful work you've been developing there. You, you and your team must be very, very proud. Um, undoubtedly, the, the plastic uh, is a topic that, that is a method that we ne must not overlook in our collections. It seems to be everywhere. Well, uh, at last but not least, I would like to introduce you your fi our final speaker, Simon Moore. Simon has worked at, at the Natural History Museum in London from 1968 to 1991 and then as a senior conservator of natural sciences at the Hampshire Com County Museum Service. He's a freelance conservator and in this field uh, since 1993 and as a natural science advisor to the National Trust. His current mission is to train as many aspiring conservators as possible in the several disciplines of natural science conservation. He's presenting his communication entitled Taxidermy Conservation, when does, it come but when does it become restoration? The many uses of Japanese tissues. Go ahead, Simon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. And good afternoon, everyone. And I hope you're having a really good day today. I certainly have been finding it very interesting, particularly the plastics about which I know very little, and uh, some of which actually come into the, into the realm of taxidermic conservation, particularly um, polyurethane, uh, which is uh, somewhat despised these days because it tends to crumble inside um, uh, taxidermy spe mounted specimens. Anyway, um, quickly moving on. <clears throat> so I'm sure you're all very much aware of problems with taxidermy, which sometimes come uh, from poor original work, unfortunately, particularly in the 19th century, and which has somehow managed to withstand the test of time, but uh, has a lot of problems uh, going on all the time. So just one of these little things. Um, <clears throat> and I do a lot of conservation work for all sorts of organizations these days, being freelance, and for particularly the National Trust, but not at the moment because of the COVID restrictions and so forth has made it very difficult, uh, but not to worry, uh, lots of other work is coming in. So always, always, um, they're very picky about what to be called the R word, uh, or restoration, in other words, uh, because basically it needs to be conservation rather than restoration. And as you can see here, uh, specimens that are in a poor state, uh, this is sometimes required. And uh, I have to look very, very careful, very carefully at it uh, to make sure they are in a stable condition, condition and not looking, as we would say, tatty, untidy, deteriorated if you prefer, uh, because it really does give natural history a bad name. 
So I'm always struggling with this uh, to uh, try and get some sort of little allowance to try and get a little bit of restoration done so that at least I can make the, the taxidermy bit stable, but also look reasonably good. Um, otherwise, particularly taxidermists uh, and collectors and those who know about natural history uh, are always complaining. Uh, and unfortunately, it's usually the the uh, property owners or no, sorry, the property managers, I should say, um, who have to take, deal with all these complaints. Uh, so it's always a little bit difficult uh, and I have to tread a very thin line uh, as exactly what I can, can and can't do. So basically, uh, anything that alters a part of the history of the specimen is not good. So again, I have to be very careful not to cover something up um, or just, just to make it look good. So it's always a little bit difficult. Now here we have an example at Cork Abbey in Derbyshire uh, where the former owners were very much into taxidermy uh, and uh, back in the 19th century uh, they tended to shoot more or less anything that moved on the estate but also greatly, greatly collected a lot of taxidermy and including exotic specimens. And this is in the bird lobby. And the interesting thing about this particular property, Cork Abbey, is it's called the, the Trust's unstately home because it's been preserved more or less as it was found uh, when the owners died and left the uh, property to the Trust. So that is always trying to be maintained. So you will see all sorts of things like peeling wallpaper, faded uh, um, <clears throat> um, pictures and so forth. Uh, and sometimes you can see the little communication wires running down here for the bells for the servants and so forth, uh, all very much exposed. Uh, and with all the taxidermy, some of it only looking half finished, even though it's well over a hundred years old, uh, all sorts of little things going on here as well. So it has to be maintained in a slightly shabby condition, uh, but looking stable. And this is, a, this is the only property within the trust um, where I, I, I have a sort of freer reign because of all the uh, basic shabbiness that's going on around me. It sounds, sounds rather ironic. Um, here, for example, is from another property uh, where there were two, pi uh, two pike in a very nice case, uh, except that the case had suffered in, in the past from damp uh, it had split down the back, uh, allowing pests in. Fortunately, the pests had not had, had much time to do any real damage, which was good. Um, and the property asked me to do a quick <coughs> uh, restoration job on it, um, which was fine from my point of view, because it looked absolutely terrible and the visitors were complaining about it. So I duly did this and there's the result, uh, looking somewhat better now uh, and hopefully not too much restored. Uh, so you can see exactly what I'm up against all the time. Another example is with taxidermy birds. If you look at the ones on the left, they're rather sort of monochromatic, uh, looking a bit dull, very dusty. You can see, see the sort of dust, dust tide line here on the, on the back of this wader, uh, a little bit on the bill and obviously on the head. All the upper surfaces well and truly covered with dust um, and the background as well. So once cleaned, uh, I then added a little, little bit of colour, just very, very plain colour, to the back uh, here, a little bit of blue, just, just to liven it up a bit. And it tends to bring the colours out slightly more uh, without actually sort of spoiling the historic context of the taxidermy case. And uh, sometimes you get this problem as well. You have to excuse my rather weird sense of humour there, um, <clears throat> where you have a profile taxidermy item uh, which has been taken from a case which has deteriorated and because taxidermists were always rather what we would call cheapskates, in other words, they'd like to spend as little money as possible um, on what they were doing. Uh, they only put one glass eye in, so this poor duck was missing an eye, which was quickly remedied, no problem at all. But if you look at the feet, they've got little bits of damage here, pest damage typically uh, to the foot webs. And uh, what do I do about that? Well, not too difficult, uh, a little bit of uh, gampy tissue underneath a little bit difficult getting it underneath, but it can, it can be done um, with a little bit of practice uh, and gluing it on, adhering it with PVA adhesive, neutral pH, of course. Um, and then just bringing the tissue up to the surface, texturing it uh, and then painting it in so that uh, you can't actually see the repair. Now, that's a typical type of repair I would do um, because otherwise it looks bad and it's quite discreet. 
occasionally too you, you come across this problem uh, in this case it's a European roller uh, and it's got the wrong colored eye in it uh, which is rather unfortunate on the left uh, you can see it has a blue eye rather like a J whereas it should in fact be brown uh, so the one on the right is the correct color uh, which was put in a little bit later and uh, also, of course, the eye ring was missing and rollers do have very uh, noticeable uh, eye rings as well. Um, so uh, an intern and I, under, well, under the intern under guidance uh, made these very clever little rings, again, using Japanese tissue. And this is Gampi tissue, very, very fine indeed. I can probably show you some in a, in a, in a little moment. And um, <clears throat> these were twisted uh, with a little bit of PVA to make them nice and hard uh, and modelled as such. They were then crimped using a spatula edge to give them a little bit of realism as you can see here uh, and coloured and put in and uh, there we go. And again another example, this is a crimson rosella, an Australian parakeet uh, in a pretty poor state as you can probably see uh, with feathers missing, in fact a great many feathers missing and somebody uh, on, one, on one of the taxidermy co conservation courses that I run, uh, cut it out of a case because it looked awful uh, and they didn't have the resources and time to deal with it. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll put that uh, in one of my storage areas uh, and I'll let, let, let loose an intern on it and they can have a bit of practice on it. So duly done. Again, the eye ring made out of Japanese tissue, some restored bits of uh, cheek feather here, uh, again, made out of Japanese tissue, textured and so forth, and then coloured. Uh, so obviously, if you look closely at it, you can see the difference in the texture of the feathers to the bits of tissue. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, a pleasing result, and it certainly looks a lot better, even though uh, it's got rather, still got rather a lot of feathers missing, but there's only so many feathers uh, that you can replace. Um, so it's not perfect, but it is at least improved. And occasionally you come across rather interesting historical specimens. Uh, this is reputedly Gilbert White's Hawfinch. Gilbert White was a vicar, um, uh, an English priest in the later 18th century, uh, and he lived at Selborne in Hampshire, not very far away, and his house was bequeathed uh, eventually uh, to a trust uh, who now run it, uh, and there are still some of his specimens there. Now, in this case, you can see here that pest, uh, this, this was uh, obviously Anthrenus larvae, the carpet beetle larvae, uh, which had eaten away the beak sheath, the horny beak sheath on this. Uh, and luckily I, I had a picture of it uh, from Pat Morris's excellent book on historical taxidermy, uh, as well as this rather nice um, X-ray as well, showing the minimal armature inside it, the wire. So uh, I had some something to work on uh, as well, which was very, very useful. As you can see, 17 exuvi uh, of, of this, from, from this single solitary beetle, which is the only one inside the case, were removed, and the whole thing was cleaned up uh, and slightly restored, painted, uh, and uh, you can see the net result here. Um, Removing the glass was quite difficult because it's one of these ones which has uh, not 18th century, I suspect, but probably mid 19th century uh, special type of binding around the outside of the glass, which obviously the museum wanted to keep. Um, so it was quite an interesting challenge. And obviously this crack, which is how the original adult beetle gained ingress in tight inside the case to lay its eggs and then do the damage. Uh, and then it died, obviously, which is that little corpse you saw on the previous slide. So altogether, a very interesting, challenging job. Um, the damp staining was left pretty much as it was. It was quite stable, uh, so no problem there. But where you do get mould actually on specimens, it can cause irreparable damage unless it's dealt with straight away. And as you can see here on this little, little hummingbird, this little colibri, um, <clears throat> these feathers around the eye have gone. They've actually been digested away by fungal enzymes. The beak sheath here has been damaged in several places. Um, uh, and although you can actually uh, deal with this, because again, you can use Japanese tissue to bind this uh, and then cunningly color it in, trying to do the feathers, uh, you would have to do a little job again, rather like with the crimson rosella specimen. So mold growth can be quite rapid, uh, particularly if the relative humidity level is really, really high. Um, and uh, 
as you can see, about a, a, a minimum of 70 percent uh, here. But ideally, for taxidermy, it should be a lot lower, round about in the 45 to 55 uh, is the percent is the ideal. Uh, and another problem here with fungus, again, you can see on this uh, razor bill specimen, uh, fungal growth here, uh, going right away along to its rather large beak bill, um, uh, very quickly swabbed away with alcohol, um, nice, nicely, quick, nice quick job, but very, very important to get it done as quickly as possible. Uh, otherwise, uh, again, irreparable, irreversible damage will be done to the specimen. <clears throat> Uh, just before we move on, <clears throat> um, if you're ever looking for adult carpet beetles outside, they often feed on these uh, um, oxide daisies or marguerites as they're sometimes called. And as you can see, very, very popular. Another couple of them down here because they're actually nectar feeders and people often uh, have the misconception that the beetles are actually doing the damage themselves, whereas no, they're just actually laying the eggs which then hatch out into the larvae which do the damage. Anyway. <clears throat> so, Japanese tissues in the context of taxidermy, uh, there are quite a few of them, um, as you can see here with all their Japanese names, uh, Washi, Mitsumata, Kozo, Kaiji, Misu, Shishu, and, and of course Gampi, which comes from the Wikstromia genus, uh, the Ni Thymolaceae. Uh, so, the property of these plants is they have unusually long fibres, and in typically uh, true Japanese traditional style, um, they make it in special uh, bamboo baskets, um, if you read down, and align the fibres as straight as they can, so that when you actually uh, have a proper piece of Japanese tissue like this, uh, its breaking strain uh, is just over two kilos, so it really is incredibly strong, and this is for a piece that weighs uh, 10 grams per square metre, so it's very, very fine, very discreet, so it is really, really useful stuff. Now, when you're using it, you do have to be very much aware of certain physical properties of the tissue. Uh, this is uh, neutral pH PVA, uh, and if you just dip it straight in uh, to apply it, it'll roll up into a, a nasty little scroll, which makes it almost unusable. Very, very difficult to get it unro unrolled again, uh, which you have to do on a glass slide using a spatula as well. Uh, so best thing to do is just drape it into the, into, the, into the adhesive and then drag it through until you no longer get a trail of adhesive following it and then quickly apply it to whatever you're going to stick it to. In this case, it's a butterfly's wing, uh, which was literally in, in, in danger of falling apart uh, and uh, on the underside, obviously, in this case. And hey, presto, uh, it repairs and the butterfly is stable and can be put back in the collection again. So if the tissue drags, when, it, when you're dragging, it starts to wrinkle, um, then uh, change the direction of the drag. As you can see here, it's starting to buckle slightly. You get this sort of like cockling effect as well. Uh, so I move, move the, tip, the tissue upwards, flattening it out again uh, as I did so. So it's a very useful technique to be able to know. Uh, as you can see here, rather more extreme, uh, where you have a very badly deteriorated butterfly um, in this case, it's a grayling, um, and it took a lot of, of very careful repairing. Uh, so, and you need very specialist equipment to do this. But again, the Japanese tissue has managed to save the day. Uh, and if you want to, you can actually paint in on the tissue once you have finished uh, doing the work. So for something like this at the top left, where the glass has obviously fallen in, uh, crash, crashed on top of these uh, large moths, um, and damaged them very, very badly indeed, uh, you can actually do a lot of repair work using this type of tissue. In some cases, these have actually already suffered damage from pests and so forth, uh, and uh, there's not much you can do about that, but at least uh, the majority of the specimens were, uh, are now back in, in good, good condition. Goodness knows what happened to the, at the ab atlas moth abdomen. There was no sign of it whatsoever, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> Teaching uh, these applications are uh, very useful. Uh, this was in Melbourne in 2014 uh, at the museum there and all their taxidermy team and quite a few other people uh, wanted to have a go with some Japanese tissue and find out about it. Uh, so I, I, I did, did, did a little day course for them which they were very happy with uh, because of course they have a lot of bats 
uh, a lot of uh, marsupial mammals which tend to have large ears. All of these get damaged, pest damage particularly, uh, and Japanese tissue will repair them. Uh, particularly if you have a really fibrous type of Japanese tissue and Mitsumata is particularly good. And washi also and mulberry uh, with, of uh, 20 grams per square metre. Uh, and if you tear it carefully, you can leave a fringe of fine fibres, which imitates the little marginal hairs that you get on mammal ears. Uh, getting near the end, uh, damaged beak of an ensifera or swordbill hummingbird, uh, which had un undergone not only uh, some pest damage here, here and here, uh, but also had uh, unfortunately been bent at some point and ne nearly broken off. Uh, and again, a little discreet uh, re re repair work with some Japanese tissue and it was really, really strong once it had set. A little bit of discreet painting after that and you've got a nice hummingbird specimen back again. So with all that, um, hopefully uh, this poor mallard, which is sort of hiding away for somewhere, might eventually come out of storage and get some uh, good conservation and possibly a bit of restoration as well. Uh, thank you, Simon. Uh, in, uh, interesting uh, presentation. In fact, it's amazing the peculiar aspects of this kind of objects and problems also. So, are we ready for our discussion? Uh, we, we will start the, this discussion and open the time to ask our speakers some questions that came from the audience. I will ask Marisa and Susanna to appear and turn on their mics. I have my questions here on my cell phone that our colleagues have been sent. And the first one, is for Susanna. Uh, it's from Sylvia uh, and she asks, can you expand on the proper wrapping materials for each type of plastic? Okay, so um, it's a difficult uh, decision because uh, even now we are still learning a lot because we are learning from our experience when we see objects in museum collections wrapped with a different type of uh, wrapping material uh, showing or not degradation so we are still learning but what we have learned so far is that plasticized plastics so I cannot say exactly for each type of plastic but for like a behavior so more flexible plastic like more uh, in, for instance inflatable PVC objects uh, rubber even foams those objects that are more flexible that show a little bit of an elasticity and plasticity they tend to, to show some tackiness with aging and there are some wrapping materials made of polyethylene that uh, accelerate the migration of those additives to the surface it's like an abs absorber material so for those types of plastics we should not use polyethylene. We should use uh, polyester or now a, a new recent study came out also saying the advantages of using silk tissue for those because another hypothesis is to use glass but we cannot use glass containers uh, for big objects or some objects that have complicated shapes. It's very difficult. So we need to handle what we have. But for those who tend to get sticky, and most of them have this flexible appearance, are more elastic, we should never use polyethylene because it's going to promote the migration of those additives and it's going to accelerate the degradation. It's going to get very sticky, very tacky, and the wrapping material is going to get stuck to the object, damaging um, even more. The others, we can use polyester or polyethylene. For instance, for polyethylene objects, we can still be using polyethylene. It's not going to be so problematic. But polyester and especially polyester with a silicone coating is very good because it's going to prevent the adhesion, even if the object starts to have a tacky uh, feeling with a silicone coating uh, in the polyester, 
we can prevent the adhesion of the wrapping material with the object. We can easily uh, identify that layer by using adhesive tape, for instance, in one part of the, Melinex is the commercial name, but in one part of the polyester film, the adhesive tape, it's not going to adhere, it's going to be very easy to remove, on the other part, it's not. So the part where, where it's very easy to take it out, it's the one we should put in contact with our plastic objects. Okay. And I think it's much this what I can say, but we are still learning. There are new publications coming out, is a, a new field. Um, it it seems that uh, every day new things are, are arriving, new news are arriving and yeah. more details and it's, it's a brand new world for plastic. No. <laughs> yeah, fortunately, uh, around the world, many people are really interested in this subject because it's urgent. Museums are lacking for solutions and uh, many projects are being carried out by really good researchers and they are um, making public their um, discoveries and what they found. So mm -hmm. what I can also recommend is for people to be, to try to update with everything that it's coming out and to use the social media because many things are uh, spread in social media, in Facebook, Instagram. So keep uh, updated with those news. And share their findings. Yes, and also share their findings yeah. because uh, it's very important for us yeah. to know how to do. Marisa, uh, I was seeing you nodding. Do you want to add something? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, another question, this is one for Marisa. Um, how do you monitor the cellulose nitrate and the cellulose acetate collection? What do you recommend for this monitoring? Um, we are not yet doing that so much. Um, the, the storage management department is doing that. So of course they have very good photos because throughout this transportation process, they made good photographs. That's the first point. So we have a good documentation that we can rely on and often also like a mapping in the museum database uh, if the cave um, patterns were already there. Um, so through their description with the words, with photos and mappings, there is a kind of a monitoring and then they come and follow. What we just in this summer suggested was um, to prepare some indicator papier, papers with um, Kressel Purper. I think this is the name in English, I'm sorry. Um, so it's an indicator that really reacts to the uh, nitrous oxides gases, meaning if the object is off gassing, you would notice this is often a preliminary state before the decay of cellulose nitrate um, is really, really fast. For cellulose acetate, normally one is using, or also at our museum, we are using acid stripes. This is one kind of monitoring. And I have to tell you, this is something we just started now to do with our colleagues. Otherwise they do by themselves. And I cannot answer more this question. What I can also tell you is that within our research of characterizing the effects of cool and cold storage on cellulose nitrate, we also need to have tools to monitor those changes and then assess if they are positive, neutral or negative. And we were just very puzzled with um, typical decay processes or features, I mean, uh, for cellulose nitrate are the cracks. We are working mainly with transparent or translucent materials, meaning that we can see the cracks increasing with time. And that's exactly the point. If we go too low with the temperature where the more cracks will appear, and then we were thinking, how can we assess that? Should we take photos? Okay, but a photo is a photo. And then you would say, well, I see more. And I would say, I, will, I see much more. And then we would start discussing. So we thought also of systems to simplify um, how to um, interpret these bigger amounts. So from an image to a value and we are still in the process. So monitoring is just an approach to get information during time. And we are still in the process of understanding which information 
we need, how often we need, so that we can also handle it. For us in the research department, it's everything fantastic. We always are interested to know more. But for our colleagues in the management department, they have not much time and they have huge amounts. I just showed you from 120,000 objects, perhaps 100,000 are in the storage area. So we have always to check these two levels of wanting to know more, wanting to follow research and having to deal with an application. I hope I answered the question. <laughs> uh, there's a, uh, an app uh, also re regarding the cellulose nitrate in assets. Uh, someone asks, um, do you use scavengers on these objects on your collections? We started this um, year uh, with a student uh, from um, Venice University in Italy. Uh, and we started a study. Uh, we used, I think, six commercial available scavengers. And we were testing um, with the samples that we are producing in our lab, meaning that we have new cellulose nitrate sheets, which was not an easy task to get nowadays. At least in Europe, it's really hard to get such material. And we did some artificial aging, meaning that we have enough samples in a similar condition and a known condition because we were doing um, much characterization of those different stages. So we had sound condition, moderate and severe degraded condition. And then we are exposing um, after one month of exposure, the scavengers didn't yet detect much um, decay products, but we could at least in some detect camphor, meaning the plasticizer, and already say, well, this would be a harmful effect, not a positive effect. So what we would like is to find in a later period, so uh, our test is still running and we will come back after six months and perhaps after one year, because we are doing it at room temperature, we're not doing very fast, we're not accelerating all the whole process. And we want always to check if this scavenger is not taking up um, the plasticizer, but only um, the um, off-gassing the assets. Okay. It's keep, ongoing. <laughs> yes, keep us dated. <laughs> okay. A question for Mr. Simon Moore from Maria, Maria Dimitrieva. What criteria do you apply in your decision to delete damaged objects from the collection if there were such cases? So basically we're talking about something that's uh, been severely damaged. Um, <clears throat> well, basically it means I've got to look at and see whether I have the materials, first of all, which normally I would have, uh, the tools, uh, and of course the manpower to deal with something like this. Uh, in some cases, uh, there are some taxidermy specimens which are too far gone, uh, because in, in the case of a bird or a mammal, say, either all the fur, skin, or the feathers have been eaten. This sometimes happens with clothes moth larvae, which tend to uh, have a tremendous uh, input of keratin, and they will even eat feather shafts and things like that, uh, in which case there's hardly anything left. With um, carpet beetle larvae, they tend to be a little bit more picky, which is good from my point of view, because sometimes I've had birds which have come to me which are nearly bald, uh, but all the feathers are sitting in a great sort of sea uh, around the base of them and it's just a question. You just have to put them there. Again. You just have to put them back again, yes. It means you have to sort them out, sort the lefts and rights out. It's a real pain. It, take, it does take a long time. I must have Challenging. Been, but some, sometimes if it's a bird that's now extinct uh, or critically endangered, then obviously it's worth the effort. Okay. Um, still a question for you regarding um, the colouring materials. Uh, someone asks, um, um, someone as was asking here, uh, what type of materials do you use for coloring? What the, are the cr uh, criteria for the selection of the coloring materials? Right. Most of the time I use gouache colors, uh, which are easily reversible. Um, <clears throat> they're easy to use, easy to mix. Um, I find them very easy. Some people prefer acrylic. I don't uh, because although it lasts well, looks good, it's much, much more difficult to reverse it. Uh, so if something does go wrong in the future, uh, it does take a lot, a lot more effort. Um, 
Uh, sim similarly, you, you can use pigments as well uh, and mix your own. Uh, sometimes I've used um, egg yolk as well um, and mm -hmm. my own tempera, uh, but that's usually just when I'm painting in the background of uh, a taxidermy case if someone wants uh, the a, background, a, a, okay. a, a little diorama. Okay, okay. Um, someone asks this, that's, that, that was the controversial question. Is recoloration necessary? What about the history of the object? <laughs> oh yes, this is, this is always a bone of contention. Uh, yes, it depends basically what, what, what's happened to the, what, sorry, what is the specimen being used for. If it's a storage specimen that's being, it's being um, researched and so forth, then basically it stays as it is. But if it's a display item, um, in which case one always hopes that the museum or other organization has at least one backup specimen used for research as well. Then if it's a display item, then basically you have a little bit more of carte blanche, as we'd say, um, and you can do with it uh, as you wish to make it look, look, look a little bit better so that people then won't complain about it, particularly if it's suffered a lot of fading, uh, UV light damage, that sort of thing. Uh, and sometimes, again, I have, I have been asked to do some retinting of fur. Um, on one occasion, it was on a tiger specimen, which uh, you could barely see the stripes anymore. And the oh. basal colour had faded to a very dull yellow. Um, and uh, they were so disappointed in it. And it was otherwise a very good specimen, uh, a nice Roland Ward, but had obviously been kept in very unsuitable conditions uh, with sunlight going over it every single day and gradually faded all the colour out. I hope that after after the, the work was done, they moved the, the object for an, a darker place. Um, in this <laughs> case, they didn't, but they did put a lot of screening. Um, ah, up, okay. Up, up that's the, the solution to, too. <laughs> to, to filter out the UV. Yeah. So, as far as I know, it still got its full depth of colour. Uh, and they also sure. put some of the fading strips in as well, just to, make, to monitor it. Right. <laughs> Susanna, I have another question for you. Um, what is the CO2 technology uh, in several wor words uh, that you used on the gloves? Uh, was it possible to stop the degradation process? So, oops, my ah. sound is on. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, it's not an easy answer because it's uh, more technical, but the CO2 technology is, um, how can I say it? We use CO2 in a different um, state, it's not as a gas, but in its supercritical or in its liquid phase. And CO2 has uh, many advantages because we can reach that point almost at room temperature, like 30 degrees. And in its supercritical uh, stage, the CO2 acts like a liquid, but also as like a gas. So we use as a solvent, the CO2 as a solvent, but as a very special solvent that can enter into the materials like a gas, but also to dissolve some things, for instance, dirt as a liquid. And it's a very green solvent. Uh, uh, we can recycle it, it's inert, it's safe, uh, it's not toxic. That's why we are using so, and this technology has already been used in conservation, for instance, for paper, the acidification, for textiles cleaning, but for this kind of uh, synthetic polymers for rubbers, foams, and also plastics like PMMA, it has never been used. And since it has so, uh, offered so many advantages for paper and textiles, we decided to test why not also in in some problematic plastics because we are using uh, sometimes uh, organic solvents that are toxic and uh, procedures that sometimes are also not so satisfactory. For instance, consolidation, most of the times we can only uh, um, go to a superficial level and we want to go more deep into the material. And we thought of using this technology as a possible solution. Um, we can work in a lot of parameters like pressure, temperature, and uh, other things to have this critical point with the CO2 with several viscosity, um, 
penetration depths in many things we can change so we are still working on it but it's it's not to uh, stabilize the material for itself the co2 is used as a vehicle like to to remove the dirt or as a uh, for a consolidation but as a vehicle as a solvent for the consolidant and to help a better penetration of the consolidant into the material um i hope <laughs> it was a good explanation because it is not easy it's uh, even for me when i started it was a little bit abstract this you know, technology but we are seeing a lot of advantages especially with the foams for instance for robert tank we tested it in some prototypes we also got uh, new gloves we aged them um, then we applied this, this CO2 in supercritical and critical states in several conditions and we got good results uh, with the use of the CO2 and the PVAC. So we are, um, we think we are going to have a good proposal for Museo de Peter to really get these gloves into a better state of conservation. Yes, we're happy to hear about it soon. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Uh, I have uh, another question. Uh, it's both for Susanna and Marisa. So you choose who wants to answer first. <laughs> How does the museum handle with several degraded plastic objects that can no longer be exposed? Uh, the degradation compromised the object historically and or the artist's proposal, the intention, what do you think of that? I don't know if Marisa wants to... No, well, okay. I think she's passing you the ball. <laughs> okay, I will say um, it really depends on the object because uh, sometimes, uh, for instance, it's never the same uh, methodology. It would depend completely on the object. For instance, the rubber tank gloves that are showing an advanced uh, degradation, uh, it was never a possibility to replace them by another type, another pair of gloves or to try to replicate something. Because in that case, the gloves were used by the goalkeeper Robert Tank and uh, even the cracks in the gloves and the marks of the aging that we are now seeing, they were um, achieved by the movement of the hand. So we want to keep that. And we, so in that case, this could uh, be, for instance, uh, called the last case, but it's not because now uh, all these aging marks are part of the object. So we want to keep as it is just to get it more stable and to stop the material losses because even the material losses are in the in this in the points of the fingers so they are on in the part where the ball was catched by the goalkeeper so even that is is a, a thing that we want to keep but i have also worked in another case with uh, some rubber based um, elements in an artwork and in that case, the artwork meaning um, was completely far away from this, the severe stage of degradation that those rubber elements were showing. So in that case, it was necessary to replace. However, it is it's never an easy decision for anyone in a museum to replace something and how to replace and replace by which material and how. So, um, uh, I have been only dealing with difficult cases so far. So my experience has been changing because it really depends on the meaning of the artwork. When the material was chosen by its aesthetic looks, its appearance, sometimes it's more um, easy to propose a, a substitution, a replacement. But when the material was selected um, because it really needs to be that specific material that is a very difficult decision. And in design, for instance, many designers are making 
the choice to select one material over other with a really good conscience and they really want, for instance, polyurethane because it's the only material who offers certain properties for comfort, for feeling, for um, things that other materials cannot offer. So in that case, to replace is, is it's almost impossible. And sometimes what uh, museums um, said, and, and I have a little experience, so I, I don't have a, such lo uh, a big, large experience, but sometimes they tend to display the object as it is, explaining the situation and uh, acknowledging that it's different now, but uh, is the way it is. In other cases where the message completely changes the piece, in that cases, I have also been dealing with some uh, cases where replacement was done, but it's never easy. It needs a dialogue, not only between the conservator and the museum director or the museum staff, but also with the author of the piece. And if not, with many other people um, from companies, from industries, factories, from people who have been using the object, uh, with people who have been experiencing the object. So it's a decision who, which involves a lot of people and it takes time. And sometimes we don't have time to make these <laughs> difficult decisions, but um, I have been learning a lot and uh, it's, it's much this. <laughs> <laughs> Marisa, do you want to say something? I don't know how much time we still have, but I can... We have, a, we have a little bit more time. Okay. So in a science and technology museum, often objects had a function and we call it, there is a kind of an expression black box. If you have nowadays a computer, it's mainly the outside of the computer, but the real machine is inside, meaning that materials are not really, like in a design museum, a very important feature, at least in this museum. Of course, we see it differently. And again, as Susanna just said, it's a dialogue. We have 25 curators, so coming back to the answer of the person who posed the question, I wouldn't say we have 25 solutions, but we don't have the procedures that I mentioned from the Science Museum group. And this is what I miss here. I would really like that the philosophy would be a bit more straightforward or the process of taking these decisions would be more written down and we are not yet there. So likely I would believe there would be a substitution, a replacement, because mainly for the public, one wants to explain how it works how it works, the science, science object or technological object. Okay, thank you. One last question to, for Simon. We have, we had more questions. I'm sorry that I, we cannot answer them all live, but at, in due time, I guess we will manage. Simon, uh, Natalie Harding asks you this question. Taxidermy, is there any sort of database that has been um, thought of that could track the whereabouts of the rare, extinct, and historical valuable uh, specimens that could be then used like a reference to assist with your original colorings? Uh, I'm sure there is. And uh, if you contact, oh, goodness me, possibly Guild of Taxidermists, uh, they may be able to help you if you look them up on the internet. Uh, I, I can't, can't remember the website address off, off the top of my head, I'm afraid. Uh, that's one source. If it's historic taxidermy, uh, then somebody like Pat Morris or the Historical Taxidermy Society, again, uh, would be a useful outlet. Uh, so that, that should trace them. Um, if there's anything else, uh, then you would have to use one of the curatorial stroke conservatorial forums on the uh, natural history websites like Natska for this country or NH Coal uh, for the rest of the world. Some, something like that. You should manage to trace uh, anything like that without any problem. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Pleasure. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Susanna, Marisa, and Simon, for your brilliant communications and your excellent contributions. Thank you. Oh, I... Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, thank you it's been a, it's, okay. it was a pleasure. Boa tarde. Boa tarde.
So I'm closing and this is it for the European whip. I have to share screen. Okay. This is it uh, for the European Online Symposium. Uh, thank you very much for your presence. We had uh, so many different particip participations from around the world uh, that we could say that it was in fact uh, an international symposium. Yep, I have difficulty here. At the end of the day, each collection has its own uh, quirkiness and the one that is at our responsibility is special on its own way. I strongly believe that we could learn a lot from each other. Uh, we hope that some of your doubts were attended. We believe that other questions have been be raised. Feel free to write us in these matters the way uh, is constant learning and sharing your findings. Thank you once again. Hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.